now reconvene the Lompoc City Council meeting for April 7th, 2020. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Mosby. Present. Councilmember Starbuck. Present. Councilmember Vega. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Gilda Cordova. Present. Mayor Janelle Osborne. Here. Any action to report out from closed session, Mr. Malave? Uh, thank you, Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss the, two, discuss the two items on the agenda, one existing litigation and two cases of anticipated litigation. Council discussed these items, but no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Out of respect for COVID-19 um, recommendations, we won't have an invocation tonight, but please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Troop, City Manager report, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, a quick reminder that the 2020 census is going on right now and it is very imperative for all the citizens, residents of Long Polk to go online and take the census. I've already done it myself. It took me maybe five, six minutes to do it. So if we can all go on there by completing that census, it helps the city gain more grants from the federal and state government. Uh, I'd like to mention that the numbers currently listed by the County Public Health also include the prisoners in the federal prison. There has been discussion to break those numbers out so that the prison has its own separate line item. So eventually it would say city of Lompoc, X amount, and then the prison. Because right now it's a large number and they're not by any means all citizens of Lompoc. Uh, another reminder, there is a community hotline to call for any questions related to COVID-19 or issues pertaining to all the different emergency orders that are going on. Uh, we received about 525 calls last week. That number is 805-875-8071, and it is also on our city website if you go under the COVID webpage. Uh, we have another one as a reminder that even with the council and state order that there are to be no shutoffs during the emergency, payments are still due. If you have any questions, please call the utility billing department for more information on what is available to the rate payer. There are also links on our city's COVID webpage that lists different assistance programs for many of the city and county's nonprofits. If you're having an issue and you need some assistance, if you go to our, again, COVID webpage, there is a, a whole listing um, that they can go to and, and call to help, get help from. The zoning code is now codified and published and it is now on the city's website. So that's a, a very good thing. It's taken a little bit of time, but it's now officially on the website. The Home Buyers Assistant Program is beginning to re, what we're calling recycle funds as two loans were just recently paid off. Um, they were paid off much sooner than the seven year payoff was supposed to be. So those will go back into the fund for other people to use. Another good news is Summit View, which is the new homes up at the Y, the 44 homes. They have now been issued nine building permits. So you're gonna be seeing a total of nine homes being built. And then as they get through more, they'll issue some more building permits. So that is moving forward. The planning department, just as an FYI, now has 59 projects with 39 of those in the definitely active stage. So the city's still having substantial development going on even during this emergency. And the last, I'm a proponent of donating blood, and there is a blood drive scheduled. We're gonna have it at the Anderson Rec Center on April 14th. During the crisis, the blood supply is dwindled to extremely low levels. If you're healthy and donate blood, it would be wonderful to those in need. It's going to be inside the building this time, rather they're in their mobile state, um, like a motorhome type situation, um, because they have to be able to set up the stations far enough apart for social distancing. Also, if you have already had, this is interesting, if you've already had the coronavirus and you're now testing negative for it, meaning you've been healed and everything, ask the staff about donating your plasma. It may be better as it can possibly be used to help those currently suffering from the virus. So instead of just doing the red blood cells, 
ask them about the plasma donations. Same thing, takes you maybe an extra 20 minutes of time, but it's one needle and you're, you're done. Um, and that's all I have. Councilmember Mosby. It's been asked to me about how we're doing with the building department and permits and such. Maybe you could fill in on, on uh, how the building and planning are working. The, build, the building permits, sorry. Yeah, building permits, uh, people, uh, contractors and such asking, how do we get a permit? The doors are locked. What's going Dave, on? Actually, I'm going to, is Christy right behind me? I'll have Christy do that. She, that's right. under her domain. So. Thank you. So building and planning are business as usual. The only difference is they call in. So if you visit our building division website, I feel like I'm hyperventilating. <laughs> if you, if you uh, visit the website, it'll give you the phone number to contact. Um, they've been really good. You just call, talk to Seth. He'll set you up with an appointment, meet you at the door, um, let you in. And then it's basically the normal process that we've been doing. And then inspections, we've somewhat um, changed it up a little bit uh, just to avoid contact. Um, we're allowing, for example, uh, someone has a hot water heater installed. They can send pictures like date stamped or call in and like walk through the inspection. So there's some things where they're able to do that. Our building official is taking the appropriate precautions, wearing a mask, um, trying to as much as possible, the social distancing and all of that in order to get through um, the process. Planning division, same thing. Uh, call Sheridan's number, I believe, is the one on the website. She sets you up. We've had meetings, but most of the developers have elected to have uh, teleconferencing or um, we're trying all of these new web-based meetings. So uh, we are accommodating and projects are still moving forward. Planning Commission meeting tomorrow? Is there something unique about it? Um, not at this point. It's still kind of the same. The, but I do believe, again, the applicants, I think a couple of the applicants are calling in for the meeting. Are, are we going to... Put it on TV? Is it going to be on TV this time? I know there was talk about potentially doing that. Yes. Okay, so televised. So the televised. So you don't have to come in, but and public comment will be handled the same way that we're doing it here. Okay. Thank you, guys. Welcome. And just so you know, your volume wasn't changed when you took your mask off. I could still hear you at the same level as with your mask on. Any other questions for city manager? All right, we'll now move to the consent calendar. Uh, public comment on consent calendar is a maximum of three minutes. If you wish to make a comment, the number to call in is 805-875-8201. We will remind you that once you call in, you need to turn down or mute the TV, radio, or computer you are using when you make that call. So, we will open the floor for public comment on the consent calendar. Seeing no one in the room, and no written comment, and no calls coming in, we will close public comment on the consent calendar. Council Member Cordova. Um, I have to recuse myself from item number three on the consent calendar. So all items listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted after one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to the council vote. Any items withdrawn from the consent calendar for separate discussion will be addressed immediately before the second oral communication near the end of the meeting. Councilmember Cordova has recused herself from item three. Councilmember Mosby. Motion to approve items one and two. Thank you. And just to note for the record, because this item is on the consent calendar, Councilmember Cordova does not need to leave the room. She can vote just with her note that she's recusing herself. Thank you. Councilmember. Starbuck? I'll go ahead and second. So we have a motion and a second, and 
We will take a vote knowing that Councilmember Cordova's vote does not count on item three. Any other questions or discussions? I thought I heard Councilmember Mosby say one and two. Oh, I thought by clarification from the city attorney that it was of the ability to take the vote as a whole, but thank you for that clarification. So we, apologies. Will, we will do item one and two first. All vote. And that passes 5-0. Councilmember Mosby. Motion to approve item three. I'll second. And we have a second. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 4-0 with one abstain. Now we will have a staff presentation from our interim utilities director, George Morrow, regarding the update from PG&E and the bankruptcy process. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, George Morrow, interim utility director. Uh, probably heard quite a bit about this PG&E merger that was going on. I wanted to give you a very short update uh, in case you had questions or maybe some of our citizens might have questions of you. So it's been going on for about a year. Uh, PG&E filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is a reorganization bankruptcy. And what they were trying to do was protect themselves from the wildfire claims. Um, there was actually a, almost an unlimited amount of liability that they had from the wildfires, and they uh, uh, wanted to you know, set up a process to deal with that. A um, couple of key items are going on. One is uh, completion for the bankruptcy is targeted for June 30. Uh, if they don't get it done by June 30, they don't have an opportunity to participate in this wildfire fund that was established by state law. There's about $21 billion in that pot that the investor-owned utilities can take advantage of, but they have to be done with their bankruptcy by June 30. So they're rush, rush, rushing. Uh, the bankruptcy court is going to meet on May 27th. Um, kind of some interesting stats about PG&E. They're the largest electric utility in the United States. They serve about 70,000 square miles. They have 23,000 employees and serve about 6 million customers. So both gas and electric, they're very, very large. They have assets of about 71 billion and uh, liabilities of 51. So you think, hey, how could you file bankruptcy with you know, assets of 71 and liabilities of 51? But it was that difference they didn't think was gonna be enough to handle the wire wildfire liabilities. So in particular, the campfire, which uh, was back in November of 2018, um, was the largest, uh, a very large natural disaster with about $16 billion of liability just for that one, uh, one fire, fire. So uh, a couple of months ago, they filed a bankruptcy plan. Uh, a lot of gory details with that. Basically, they're focusing on safety. They're going to refresh their board of directors. They're going to appoint um, a chief risk officer, a chief safety officer. Uh, the the uh, executives of uh, PG&E are going to have uh, safety as one of the key metrics in their executive compensation that they're going to have to meet. Um, they're going to maintain all of their employee contracts and labor union uh, agreements, and they're putting aside about $25 um, billion. So I'm, I'm on page four. Yep. Uh, they've got about $25 billion they're putting aside for the wildfire victims and, uh, um, and then contributing some of their own hard-earned money uh, to lessen the ratepayer impact. So um, it's not been with some controversy. The governor's basically opposed that particular plan. Uh, he was hoping for a really different PG&E to come out of this merger, uh, out of this bankruptcy, uh, something he called a reimagined company, uh, that they would make a lot of investment in their very outdated and unsafe electric grid. And uh, if uh, his demands weren't satisfied, he said, hey, we're going to we, you know, we're going to turn you into a public entity. So kind of got their attention that way. And the PUC, the California Public Utility Commission, which regulates PG&E, uh, sort of like the council here regulates the local electric utility, uh, they were upset about how the PG&E handled the safety issues and also about their PSPS program, that power supply uh, curtailment program. They didn't think they handled that very well. So they were upset. Well, the reason I'm here today really is this next slide. It, apparently, uh, the uh, PG&E came to an agreement to satisfy the governor and the PUC. And so they're doing a couple of things. One is they're pleading guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter as it relates to that 2018 campfire and to one 
uh, charge of unlawfully starting a fire. So that kind of sets the framework for resolving this uh, bankruptcy. Uh, also, the extra things that the governor uh, wanted was at least three years without them paying their shareholders a dividend. That's about $4 billion that could be used to fix their electric system up. And also, the, uh, he asked that about $7.5 billion of shareholder assets, so the shareholders are taking a haircut in the bankruptcy, which is pretty typical, that that money also would be set aside for um, reducing their debt so that their ratepayers don't have to pay that in the future. Now, the interesting thing I've highlighted in the last item on this slide is if they don't get this done by June 30, PG&E promised they would uh, appoint a chief transition officer and initiate a sale of the company and, uh, and turn it into basically a public entity like the city of Lompoc has. The next slide uh, says there's a lot of folks interested in that concept. Uh, there was a Senate bill filed by a um, senator serving San Francisco to create what's called the Northern California Electric Utility District. And it would be a, a public entity, like a municipal utility district, have its own governing body, uh, would not be regulated by the CPUC, but would be governed by that board. And that district could go ahead and acquire the PG&E system through eminent domain, so they had the authority to do that. As well, other cities that are served by PG&E, we are not, could, uh, could also try to pick up a piece of the PG&E system, such as City of San Francisco or some of the Yolo County cities that sort of want to take over their own distribution system. Um, so uh, that bill, eh, it's in slow motion at the moment, so I don't expect it to pass. Uh, heavy, heavy opposition from IBEW and pg and itself, as you might expect. Uh, also, uh, on the next uh, slide, we're targeting other cities and counties in the state. Uh, we've been lobbied a little bit here in Lompoc to support kind of a statewide effort to, you know, let's break up pg and &E and turn it into a public entity. Uh, so, uh, what I've got on this slide are just some negative things, some difficulties in trying to, to turn pg and &E into a public entity. One is you have to pay the value of their system and it's upwards of maybe $100 billion, so somebody would have to raise that money. It would be very complex. They're an extremely large entity, gas and electric. They're having, the PG&E even has a hard time managing it, so it, you know, it's gonna be a difficult undertaking. And you can't walk away from the liability. You know, that you're gonna take over a gas system and an electric system that has issues. Uh, think of the San Ramon uh, pipeline explosion as well as the wildfire. So, you know, that can't go away. And so if you take them over, you're sort of going to take on that responsibility. And again, IBW was uh, heavily opposed to that. Now, what about the impact on Lompoc directly? So I did want to bring you this information briefly. On the next slide, I point out that uh, there's actually very little uh, impact on Lompoc. Uh, you have your own electric utility here. Um, they don't provide natural gas to Lompoc. That's the uh, uh, SoCal Gas Company. We do use their transmission lines, but these are deregulated, sort of, and they're handled by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, not California. So the rates we pay are regulated by the feds. That would not change. The lines are actually operated by the California Independent System Operator, that not PG&E, so that would not change. The, the one concern we did identify is these power safety shutoffs that, um, you know, we need to keep an eye on because they could impact Lompoc if PG&E were to turn off their grid. And, and, and not communicate with us and, and that type of thing. So uh, that's probably the only exposure we really have here to this bankruptcy. And uh, so in summary, uh, again, there's very little impact on the city. Um, there's a big rush to get this bankruptcy over. Uh, the hearing on May 27th through the, on the, in the federal court could be the, you know, kind of the beginning of the end of this thing. But we're gonna to continue to monitor the city manager, uh, Tekin and I, just to make sure that nothing comes out of that that could hurt, uh, you know, hurt our electric system and our, uh, and our community. So, though we're not thinking it would, uh, would happen. So, those are, that's my presentation for today. Any comments or questions? Uh, Thank you, George. Uh, NCPA, as we're members of, has also been on top of this and been a partner in oversight and watching the lawsuits and participating in some of them as a way to help us address that issue that it might impact us locally. Yeah, and I think they were glad that they didn't actually go all in with a lot of money and expense because in a way it doesn't impact their members as much either, just like us. So, so I think we both were aligned very well. Any questions? Councilmember Vega. Yes. 
Um, thanks for the update. I appreciate it. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the unincorporated areas, even though they're not a voting member, they are still labeled as Lompoc. And I think that uh, all due respect to everybody to, to provide the information necessary for our inner city community and our outlying areas. So thank you so much, okay? I, think, I appreciate it. Great, and, and um, I'm gonna ask the electric utility manager maybe another meeting. Uh, he's done some update on our rate comparisons with PG&E. We actually look really, really good. We did provide that to the utility commission last month, and I think we'll bring it forward as, a, as an information item here in the near future. So when you get asked that question, how do we look compared to some of these other communities, uh, you have a good answer. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now we'll open the floor for oral communications. You have three minutes to speak on any city-related matter. If you call in, the number is 805-875-8201. And once again, turn down your computer, TV, or radio once you call in. We'll begin with in-room comments first. Seeing none, we will go to calls. and a Lompoc resident. Just because we're sheltered at home, it's still important to talk about the significance of April and what it means to the center in our community. April is Child Abuse Prevention Month and Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Last week, we should have been celebrating the cook-off with our annual, or kick-off, excuse me, with the annual pinwheel planting, but understandably, that was canceled. But we are a resilient group of individuals, and it's important to us to get the message out that child abuse prevention is everyone's business. We managed to get a few pinwheels planted in front of our office, and the men and women of the Lompoc Police Department supported our efforts as well by taking pictures. This year, we, if we had held the event in Lompoc, we would have planted 228 pinwheels, representing 1,137 total referrals investigated by Child Welfare Services in 2019 for the Lompoc region. One pinwheel is too many. As an agency, we want to continue to raise awareness because right now our children are incredibly vulnerable. They are at home with the very people that cause harm. Approximately 90% of child sexual abuse victims know the perpetrator in some way and approximately 68% are abused by a family member. We don't want you or the community to be fooled by media that might report that reports are down. Reports coming into, th into the child abuse hotline may be down, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. Truth is, all of the mandated reporters that used to have eyes on our children every single day are also sheltered at home. So in reality, you can't report what you don't see. We know that, we know that abuse is most likely happening at an alarming rate. It's just not being reported, reported. This frightens us a lot, but I think as a community, we can all do something and encourage the see something, do something mentality. As citizens, if you see something that doesn't seem right, report it. Call 911 or Child Welfare Services and let them investigate. I also encourage you as neighbors, friends, and family, don't let fear of getting involved hold you back from reporting. Think about that child and be their voice. I also mentioned that April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Everyone has the power to stop sexual assault, sexual harassment, and abuse before it happens. We all have a right to safety in our lives, to have boundaries that are respected, and to make choices when it comes to what happens to our bodies, no matter if we're at home, at school, in the workplace, or in public places. As a community, we need to focus on the big picture and send the right messages first starting with stopping victim blaming. Sexual abuse and assault are actions that one person chooses to inflict on another, and we need to hold individuals who commit abuse accountable. 
While COVID-19 has altered the way we normally deliver our messages, we will continue to educate via social media as best we can. We encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and our new YouTube channel called Staying Centered as we share various messages of education, hope, and healing. Our 24-hour support line is still available, and we encourage individuals to call when they need help. As members of the City Council, if you believe in the work we do, I encourage you to stop by our office and take a picture of it in front of our sign with the pinwheels, and then share it with your constituents to let them know that you take child abuse prevention seriously because you, too, want all of our children to be safe from harm, and while you're at it, share that 24-hour support, support phone number so that your people know who they can contact should they need help. There are resources in this amazing community, and it's up to all of us to share the important information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Um, I really appreciate the call. This is a huge issue for us right now with the number of people that are in um, the stay-at-home response. So I did allow her extended time in order to share the important message and the fact that North County Rape Crisis Center is still available and providing services to our community. So as she says, um, don't be afraid. Contact them and help those that are potentially home in an environment they normally wouldn't be in 24-7. Do we have any more calls? Seeing no more calls, we'll turn to written communications. Do we have any written communications? No written communications. So we will close oral comment and we will return to our unfinished business and have the management services Dean Albro provide an update on the City of Lompoc 2019-21 biennial budget. Hi, good evening. Um, well, tonight on the agenda, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the current economy the general fund's history, uh, and the CAFR, the actuals for 2019. And then I'll, I'll, I'll do a mid-year mid update on where we look like this year. And I'm gonna split it up into two seg segments. I'm actually gonna do the presentation that I did, or put together for March 13th, and then I'll, I'll actually close with what's happened since then, which has been a lot. And then we'll all look at some um, analysis uh, for a 10-year projection. Well, right now, if we were to say that the unemployment numbers are, are, are great, I'd be lying with 2.2 million people applying for unemployment in California right now. But it was, it was pretty low. We've seen the housing market rebound. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. You know, the slow down the economy whenever it puts the brakes on, could have a ripple effect. Um, uh, debt levels are still safe. Inflation, if we start dumping money with stimulus packages, we could get hit with a little bit of inflation, not to mention the recession before that. Um, GDP was doing really well. I know that we're going to see some dips here in GDP with most of its consumption and, and goods that we're just not buying, like cars. Um, and overall wages are doing well until this COVID hit us. Challenges, we still have a lot of unfunded um, liabilities. We're still gonna see a skilled labor force shortage with the baby boomers retiring. Um, we're still gonna see a shortage of houses in this local area. Um, this is what I had in my presentation, the equity. I kinda saw that I thought we had a little bit of a, a bubble. Um, I think that some of the downturn of the, you know, our markets, our equity markets and stock market, part of it's a little bit of a correction, I believe it was ready. Um, I could be wrong, but you know, I thought that the stocks were a little bit overvalued. Um, inflation, I mean, no, sorry, interest rates. Um, the Federal Reserve has cut the interest rates um, before. I thought they were a little too low, and now they're obviously very low, and, and we're gonna see a pretty big hit to our, our interest earnings across the board for all our funds. And of course, we have our political extremists now who always wanna dabble into the market. Well, if I could, I want to go back and look at the 10-year history of the, the general fund. Um, it's our policy to have 25%, about $8.9 million. Right now, 
after June, I should say June 30, um, 2019, we had 1.6 or 4.5. You can see that the, the un unrestricted fund balance is this light blue section. And you can see the, in the middle one, that was what we had in our economic uncertainty. 2019 was the first time that we actually dipped into that. And if you can see the dark blue, this is actually um, capital, uh, basically for the pool demo. And you'll see that go down as we do that this year um, in 2020. If we look at our revenue lines over the last 10 years, they really have nice looking curves. And you know, anytime you see them going up, that's a good thing. Um, especially when you see our sales tax numbers. The second two, oops, didn't mean to hit that button. The second two lines, you can't see it very well, but those are our um, property tax. It's where we get the majority of our funding from the city. And you can see that good curves as the tax rolls move up. Um, even we're doing pretty good in TNT, but we'll talk about what's happening in the last year and currently. But good looking revenue streams, you know. Um, look at 2019, we'll look at the actuals here. Anytime I do these presentations, I always like to start with the original budget. Um, when you guys give us a budget, we like to try and get it balanced, of course. But if it's not balanced, like we're right here, we're showing that we started with a $543,000 deficit plus. Um, you know, that's our marker. That's our, our marching orders, if you will. If we look at what we actually ended up with, we ended up with a $1 million deficit. We take out the one-time anomalies or capital outlays. You can see the 133 coming off and we ended up with an operating of 880,000 deficit, um, which was a variance of 330,000, which is less than 1%. I think that's pretty good. That's a pretty good goal to stay within 1% of your budget. Um, so if you look at our revenues um, and look at the variances from our, our projected numbers, we ended up being a little bit short on the, on the property tax. Um, our sales tax did a lot better than we thought. We, we had almost $540,000. TOT was slightly lower. Um, we didn't have the building permits that we thought. We were hoping that the Summit View would go off a little earlier. We've had a few campsites that um, need repairs, if you will, or renovations, and we're doing that now. So we did see a lot of spaces that weren't being utilized for revenue sources, and uh, we're working on getting that fixed. Uh, we saw a little bit uh, of a deficit in the aquatic center, and that's give or take. Um, the library, even though that's a negative number, if you look at the one below it for revenues from other agencies, that's a lot of the libraries right there. They've done a really good job of getting grants and also keeping, yeah, so you'll see a revenue and an expenditure variance on for the library, but they've actually done really well. The interest earnings, that 113000 even though it sounds like we did really well, that's all unrealized. Um, whenever you hold instruments that are better value than what the market's doing, which we have, you'll see an unrealized um, revenue increase. Uh, we won't see those come to fruition because we hold all our, our, our investments until they either get called or to maturity. Um, Finding penalties were a little bit lower. Uh, streets and roads are usually offset by expenses. I know we have too much revenues and, and expenses, and I'll just skip over that if you don't mind. So last year we had some uh, pretty good vacancy numbers in the general government um, planning, and I know that looks like a, a bad number to have over 129, but that's really our zoning update that wasn't in the budget. Um, building, we did good with the surplus. Keep in mind here that pluses are good, um, negatives are deficits. Police had a little bit of money left over. Fire was uh, 500,000 over, and it's mainly attributed to overtime. Rec did pretty good. In parks, we had some vacancies there that we had some salary savings. Um, and then the library, you'll see, like I said, the expenditures are, are, are greater than our budget. That's because they did the restroom improvements and they got a lot of grants, so that's a good, that's a good sign. And the transfers out, that's just a, a, an item that wasn't budgeted for the Chevron project. So if we look at the net cost of what 2019 looked like, sorry, this button, there you go. Um, it cost us about $22 million net to run the general fund. And you can see the breakdown there, of how much each division costs. That's the same graph if you wanted to look at these. 
I thought something that's worth mentioning is we did about three quarters of a million dollar increase in taxes year over year and incremental increase. That's good, we don't normally see that much, so that was really good, and a lot of it was in the sales tax numbers. Mid-year, how did we do this year? Or how are we doing this year? And this is where things get crazy, huh? Well, when we started off, we originally ha um, had a budget of 300 and a deficit of 315,000. All in all, I was projecting 1.2 million uh, deficit. Majority of that is, again, one-time anomalies, the pool demo, we had to fix the HVAC system in police, and we also did the restrooms and uh, finished the restrooms and the carpet. We're getting ready to start the carpet heaven. So anyways, we had that projected for this year. I'm not sure where we're gonna be at the, at the end of the year, but I wanted to take out the one-time anomalies again so you can see what our operating um, deficit was. And again, it's a rate around 300,000 uh, projected, which is less than 1%, so I think we're staying pretty good on, on the budget. Um, this year we had property tax come in about 85,000 higher than we budgeted. Cannabis, we had 450,000. We think we're gonna see something closer to 700. Um, that could change too with the COVID with everybody, I guess, buying it. That's what I'm hearing. Um, TOT, we've been hit pretty hard. It wasn't as many rocket launches here. And we're about 410,000 was what we projected to be shortfalls for this year. Uh, a little bit for um, business license, building permits are low. The Summit View, again, we thought we would kick that off a little earlier. We have uh, uh, about eight spaces at, at the RV park that we're trying to fix the wiring so they don't keep tripping the breakers. And hopefully we'll get those up and rolling and, and get our revenue streams back, but we're gonna be up a little short there. Um, the engineering internal service costs, that's mainly for, to do the work on the um, pool demo that we didn't budget. Um, I'm kind of disappointed in this last one. I, I projected 78 deficit in the recreation. Mario told me I was wrong and I wanted him to prove me it. So I'm kind of disappointed we don't get to do that. <laughs> um, a little bit less than the jail services. And then of course the streets are able to be offset by expenditures again. Um, this year we had a lot more vacancies in the general government. Um, planning's a little bit over. Um, that's mainly because we had some planning staff that were overhired for a while. Um, building and inspection, we, we anticipate that we're going to be a little over there because the contract labor is a little bit higher than FTEs, and we just had got FTE staff qualified to fit those positions. Um, police is about 318, almost 319,000 um, over. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see right there, so that's an offset. So these two offset each other. There, we, we had a uh, savings, and we just had to fix that H HVAC system, and they got that fixed last Friday. So... They're pretty excited about that. We've had some vacancies also in rec and parks. The big negative in, in non-departmental, those are all our held positions that was budgeted. Um, also the same thing, the library's done a really good job of getting grants, so they'll have a negative variance. Um, I encourage them to keep getting that negative variance. So we had some uh, vacancies in building and facilities. And like I said, I talked about the pleach HVAC, but then the demo of the pool, which was, wasn't budgeted, so that's a variance. I like that I got, I got my little guy with a mask on. That's pretty cool, I thought. <laughs> anyway, so what's the effect of the impact of the corona COVID? Um, we're going to see some drop in TOT. We know it. Um, and there's just nobody going to the hotels. We are, I don't think we're going to have a big an impact as I thought on sales tax when we went and did our analysis. Uh, I think that it'll be light. They we're definitely going to see all the rec programs, Dewey Center um, and the Aquatic Center, see some big hits um, since we're shutting everything down. And we're also slow um, shutting down the River Park. So even though we're doing the renovations, it's probably a good time if since we're shutting it down. And we're also not seeing planning, as many planning, building, and a lot of the other permits that we see throughout the year. And also with the Fed dropping the interest rates pretty much to nothing, we're going to see a, a short deep amount of uh, uh, income from interest earnings. Um, yeah. If you look at the, where our unassigned fund balance is at the bottom here, we had about 1.6. Uh, we're projecting that we're going to be over that. We'll probably end this year with the deficit. 
Um, one thing I want to talk about was the, uh, another big impact to us was the CalPERS. Everybody loves CalPERS, huh? The market value in 2019 was about $370 billion for the CalPERS in totality. Um, yesterday it was about 358.6, so they're projecting about a 3% um, decrease in valuation, about $11.6 billion. So what does that mean to us? The city um, will lose about $6.4 in market value, and we'll miss our projected earnings um, at 14.4. So we're we're anticipating a $20.8 million um, decrease, uh, increase in our unfunded liabilities. Um, to give you an idea, since we're on the general fund here, it's probably about $500,000 a year once they, what they'll do is they'll compress that into a 20 year um, payback schedule. They won't phase it in and do 30 like they have been in the past. They want everybody to try to pay those UALs off. Um, yeah. So it's going to be, a, it'll be a hit, but it's not as bad as what the newspapers are saying because they're comparing it to January. Well, I thought it was uh, a, a good to do some projections, 10-year projections. Um, if you go back to 2014, I presented this to council and we, I designed the model and put it in the budget book to memorialize it. And this was my analysis back then. I, I thought that we would recover. I also put the caveat in there that I thought that CalPERS was making a mistake, and especially for Lompoc, because we were losing a lot of people in public safety, and they were going out of tier one and into tier, and being a new person would come in in tier three. Well, the contribution rates were tremendously different. I didn't think they were collecting enough money. And then um, in 2016 and 17, they implemented the UAL payments on the payment stream, and, and there's our graph. And this was in the budget book. 1719. Um, so if I look at today's before uh, sales tax or anything, you can see they're almost identical between the two. Oh, and I guess I should explain this graph. Huh? Um, if you look at the blue lines, that's our revenue lines. These are our expense lines. Uh, up here is our, our goal, our 25% uh, reserves. And you can see where our fund balance is projected to go through. Like I said, they're almost identical. There's nothing's really changed between those in two years. But we did have some changes here with the implementation of the sales tax and some other projection. Um, this is what our analysis would look like for a 10 year projection, meaning it's gonna take us about 10 years to restore our fund balance if we were to do, and I'll, I'll go over the assumptions what I put into the model, that we'd pay back uh, CalPERS, we don't necessarily have to do a fresh start. I don't, I don't, we don't, I'm not, I was just what I put in the analysis that we would aggressively go after doing a 15 year payback. Um, the sales tax is the model, putting back the held positions for the police, parks, and the ones at large, it was almost 1.3 million we have in the budget as held positions. And even though we have almost 24 positions in the general fund vacant, we're still not able, you saw the numbers before, we're still not able to meet that even with all the changes that we did. And we did a lot of work to try and get it closer there. And also to restore outside agencies. And that's where we get this analysis of what it would look like and how long it would take us to get our fund balance back. Other than that, it's a quick update. If anybody has any questions? Councilmember Mosby. Couldn't quite understand that. So, Mr. Alvaro, can you go back to slide? I don't have a number for me. The 1827 projection. So right before you started in this, where, where was it assumed that we were able to pass out the raises that we passed out? I mean, it's nearly a million dollars worth of general fund raises that we were told we could afford. I mean, how, I know it's hindsight, but I'd like to look at the history so it won't repeat movements. 
mean, we were, we were told we wouldn't have had a problem, but I think if we're looking at that, we... Well, uh, to say that we didn't know, I mean, this is what I gave in 2014. I, I kind of indicated that we were in trouble, but powers to be chose other directions. And well, we were told, directly told, by the person before you that we could afford the raises. And I, mean, I know you had a chart here, and I, I questioned it, but we were told everything's good. Numbers are coming in hard. And I guess, as we were told right be before this chart came out. I didn't see it that way. I'm sorry. I, I, I was been professing all along that this is what we're going to be up against. Uh, like I said, in 2014, I was kind of reading the writing on the wall. And I know it, it's a difficult thing when you're passing out raises, especially when you're talking public safety. You know, you have to have an, you have to pay them enough that they're going to want to stay. Um, if you also remember what I said here too, is that I was talking about how people were going to leave tier one faster than the Calpers actual model was was doing because we were losing people left and right because we weren't they would just make so much money somewhere else. So yeah, you're right. It's kind of a double edged sword though. It's kind of you lose, you lose, you win, you win. However you want to say it, but. I mean, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot is what I'm getting at here. It, um, it definitely steepened that, that graph right there. It wasn't sustainable, I'd say. Yeah. Any more questions for Mr. Albro? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we will move on to item four, council discussion regarding long-term liabilities with California Public Employee Retirement System, CalPERS. Mr. Troop. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, something that was done, excuse me, back when we were looking into this at the last budget cycle, and then come, um, forward when it was the, the budget ballot, me ballot measure was approved to go on the ballot, um, it was noted back in the beginning of March that this should come back as quickly as possible, essentially the next meeting. That's when everything hit the fan at that point. So we've missed it by the one meeting. So we do have our financial advisors here tonight. They're, to, they're gonna be going over um, where we sort of stand today as a city, what are the different options that are out there, some recommendations on their side of what they see. They do this for 40 to 50 other cities. Um, next week, they're down in Riverside looking, talking to them for their issues they have going on. So I thought after the budget cycle we went through, there was a lot of good feedback from their expertise. We asked them to come back and do that again. So they have a presentation tonight that I think will walk through the council on all the different opportunities that are out there and what the options are, pros and cons, and then sort of end up with a, a recommendation. Council Member Starbuck. Is this gonna change based upon the CalPERS phone call teleconferencing that's gonna happen tomorrow? It, there, there's, there's so many changes out there right now going on. <clears throat> there's the CalPERS phone call, excuse me, <clears throat> the governor with his sales tax that will allow certain levels of businesses to hold on to their sales tax for a year you know, what, what kind of impact is that? So, yes, there is a possibility of some changes. Any more questions before we begin the presentation? All right. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Let me turn your mic up just a little bit. Okay, I'm sharing it now. Did it come through? Not yet. I don't see it. So do you. Okay. Are 
are you still sharing your screen? Oh, uh, there we go. Works now. We can see your PowerPoint presentation now, or if you want to put it in present. Okay, great. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor, Honorable Council Members. This is Mike Meyer with NHA Advisors. Nice to be back with you virtually. Um, as the city manager just mentioned, um, we were in front of you in the fall, I believe it was last August, talking about CalPERS related costs and um, potential strategies to address those rising costs. So just as a, a quick recap, um, let me just quickly maximize my screen here. <clears throat> okay. As a, as a quick recap, uh, the city does currently have a $96 million unfunded liability with CalPERS. Uh, that is a debt with CalPERS that's being amortized at 7%. Uh, that number does not include any of the uh, potential negative impacts from poor returns this fiscal year. And so we will get into that a little bit in this presentation. Um, a few things have happened since the last time we were in front of you. Uh, on a positive note, uh, the city did uh, pass the sales tax measure, which will, um, of course, strengthen the city's financial health. Um, on the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, you're all well aware that uh, there's been a lot of disruption uh, socially as well as economically. Um, the financial impacts are yet to be seen, but I think it's um, fairly common knowledge that uh, certain revenue streams are going to be down for fiscal year 20, uh, especially sales tax, TOT, uh, business license tax, and then uh, potentially uh, in 2021 as well. Um, in addition to be, being down, uh, the governor has put in place uh, a, an opportunity for businesses to defer their sales tax payments as well. So there may be a lag um, and a, a delay in terms of when cities will um, actually collect that, that sales tax. So um, then obviously the other, the other issue that we'll get into is the potential impacts from uh, poor CalPERS returns, which may drive up the uh, city's UAL uh, a bit higher. So this presentation does um, touch on a few of the options that we um, briefly talked about last time, which is a fresh start option with CalPERS, uh, a couple other options where the city would use uh, surplus monies to fund uh, a separate 115 trust. Uh, and then also a UAL restructuring using a bond. And so we'll get into that. I think it's important given the um, you know, current crisis to keep a few things in mind. And we outlined these on slide six. Uh, you know, financial flexibility and liquidity should be priority number one right now for the city, uh, especially given the unknowns with the coronavirus. Um, I think we all, we know that um, expenses are, are rising due to CalPERS costs, but now with this, we also, uh, the city may be seeing a significant revenue hit for the fourth quarter, as well as moving into 21. And so, um, you know, the city does have 1.6 million of unassigned reserves uh, based on our review of the uh, financials, but this is, uh, you know, well under the city's target of 25%. Uh, so I think, you know, prioritizing uh, bolstering those reserves, especially during a, a volatile period, um, would be would be prudent. So, just flipping forward in the presentation, the first couple of slides are slides that um, the council has seen before. Uh, quick definitions of the annual cost that you make to Calpers. Uh, the first being normal costs, and the second uh, piece of second component is the payment to amortize the unfunded liability. And this is the largest portion of the city's annual payments. Uh, the reason it's grown to 96 million is due to a number of factors, but most notably um, assumption changes by CalPERS, as well as uh, CalPERS not hitting their investment targets over the last 10 to 20 years, um, combined with the fact that um, any new changes to the UAL, be it for 
um, added costs or if it's an offset, if they have a good year, those changes will be implemented over a 20 year period instead of the old 30 year period. So that just uh, creates a bit more uh, pressure as well on general fund budgets. In terms of uh, a chart that you have, uh, you may remember from last fall uh, is on slide 10. This is, this is just the city's UAL repayment schedule in light blue. So the, the color on the bottom there reflects the payments on the 96 million um, of UAL that's amortized over uh, at 7% interest rate. And then what we've done in dark blue is layered in a hypothetical uh, repayments, assuming CalPERS does in fact end this fiscal year with a, with a loss. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of estimates out there and it's moving around daily just because the, the stock market and the bond market has been uh, extremely volatile. Uh, it's also very hard to assess where CalPERS is given that um, part of their portfolio is in real estate. So, um, you know, we've been hearing uh, numbers anywhere from, you know, 0% this year all the way down to a 10% loss. And so uh, these numbers here do reflect CalPERS having a 10% loss, which, which would increase the UAL by about 35 million. Obviously, if they do better than that, it wouldn't be um, as much of this. And, you know, it also should be stated that there is time to recoup these losses. As you can see in the dark blue, these uh, impacts don't hit you in 21 or 22. They would hit the city's budget in 2023 and then gradually ramp up um, over the first five years and then kind of flatline for the next uh, 15 years. So there is time for CalPERS to recoup the cost, but I think in terms of uh, planning for the future, um, it is uh, probably a good idea to expect that there will be some sort of increase uh, layered in from, from this year's returns. <clears throat> so moving on into the section uh, where we touch on potential strategies to address uh, rising pension costs. Um, these are probably the three most popular um, that local agencies have utilized. Uh, the middle one being probably by far the most popular. Uh, the first one is known as a, a fresh start amortization. And so this is where the city would uh, request from CalPERS a, a repayment shape that's shorter than it currently has. So uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that one in a second. The other option is to use reserves or any future surplus revenue to uh, fund a separate trust that's not managed by CalPERS. Uh, that's a 115 trust. Um, and then, or, or the city could use that surplus money to actually make uh, payments directly to CalPERS to pay down additional UAL. And then lastly, there uh, are some local agencies that have and are currently looking at um, utilizing bonds to uh, restructure their uh, UAL. And those are known as pension obligation bonds. Slide 13, a little bit more on the fresh start concept. So as I mentioned, uh, this is, you do pay the same interest rate to CalPERS of 7%. Uh, CalPERS forces you to actually shorten the maturity. So uh, the one benefit of this is that you do uh, save on interest rate uh, payments uh, in the back end. Uh, you will pay for that in the next 15 years. And so in this chart on the right side of the slide, we've uh, depicted in the gray bars what the city's current repayment shape is for the 96 million. Uh, and then in blue, above that would be the added payments each year that the city would be on the hook for uh, under a 15 year uh, fresh start. And then obviously the savings would come uh, after 2000. 35. Uh, the one drawback of this and the one reason we don't see this strategy utilized very often is that this schedule is uh, locked in once you request it from CalPERS. So there's no going back to another schedule or your current schedule. So there's really a lack of, um, of flexibility that uh, I think in normal times uh, is something that we uh, bring up because that, you know, uh, reduced flexibility is not always what 
uh, cities are seeking. But in these times, I think it's it's also important to uh, to note that. I think what we wanted to bring up, and, and this relates to the um, the second options, which are to use surplus each year to either fund a 115 trust or to pay down um, extra UAL each year to CalPERS, um, is that those options uh, can be used in a way very similar to the fresh start, where the city could set aside that, that annual um, money that you're budgeting, that surplus, uh, and then use that money to, to fund the 115 or to pay down extra with CalPERS, but not in a way that um, is restrictive. So you still maintain flexibility so that in certain years, if that surplus isn't there, um, you wouldn't have to be forced to, to make that payment. And so what we, um, what we did is we, I'm going to flip back to 13. This was the fresh start option where the city would budget and make extra payments each year that are shown in blue. And what we assumed is that the city would continue to budget those payments, but would set those monies aside in a 115 trust and invest those monies and let it grow over time. And this chart on 16 uh, in the orange line uh, depicts what the growth of that section 115 trust would look like if those, if those surplus payments were uh, deposited into the 115 trust each year. And so what it shows is that that, that orange line, the, the, the assets in the 115 trust would grow to a level um, that was the same amount as the outstanding CalPERS UAL by around 2036. Uh, that's a time where you could fully extinguish the UAL. So uh, really just to show that this is a, an alternative to a fresh start where you, you get to the same objective, which is paying your UAL off early and saving in the back end, but it's doing so um, while still maintaining flexibility, which may be even, uh, I think, which is always important, but during this uh, time, maybe even more important. Mike, this is Jim. Can you explain real quick on the 115 if the city put money into the trust? Um, can we take it out and use it again on anything? Just if you can do a little more detail on how it, it holds it in there. Yeah, so once you, uh, you set up a 115 trust, um, CalPERS actually does offer a 115 trust option. It's fairly new. There are providers out there um, that are a bit more active. Uh, when you set these up, once the money is deposited into that account, it must be used for pension or OPEB related expenses. So um, it does give you flexibility to if you were having a challenging budget year and you needed assistance just making your normal annual contributions, you could pull that money out to, to use it uh, to pay CalPERS. Um, you can, like in the example I just showed, you can let it grow over time and not touch it. And at some point uh, down the road, take that money and just use it to pay off your entire UAL with CalPERS. Um, you could really use it in a lot of different ways. And that's why, um, you know, really the flexibility is a key benefit of the 115 trust in the sense that um, you could use it uh, when you need it, but it does have to be used for pension or OPEB related expenses. And then I think one thing I didn't mention is that, um, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle that gives the city the chance to invest um, and earn more on their money. Uh, you're restricted right now with your uh, general fund reserve. So uh, by, by using a 115 trust, you're essentially doing what CalPERS is doing and um, investing the money in the marketplace. And you do have um, a bit more options than you would with CalPERS, who takes that money and puts it in one fund. So if you did set up a 115 trust, you would have an investment advisor as part of that team, and you would uh, set up various <clears throat> portfolios that are based on your um, horizon, uh, similar to a personal 401k, your investment objectives, and you can invest in um, you know, more aggressive 
stock heavy portfolio or a more conservative one if you um, intended to use that money in the short term. So a um, bit more flexibility there. Uh, this chart on 17 uh, just quickly compares the 115 trust to uh, another option you have with your surplus monies or reserves, which is to actually just take that money and send it to CalPERS. Um, by doing that, you would directly reduce the UAL and eliminate some of those payments associated with the UAL. And so there's really no um, right option. I think if we knew who would perform better moving forward in the marketplace, that's that then it becomes an easy decision. But you know, that's, that's an unknown. And so uh, for a lot of our clients who uh, <clears throat> set up policies to start uh, taking a certain percentage of surplus revenues and, and paying extra into the pension, um, they do a little of both. So um, at least at least some of our clients do where uh, you do have a 115 trust that's funded to uh, maybe an amount that um, gives you some uh, solid liquidity and flexibility. And then with some of the other money, you actually use that to um, kind of pay off certain parts of the UAL that, that makes sense. And uh, a lot of the layers that may be contributing to the uh, near-term peak in payments. If I could ask a question here. Uh, no. We have, we have feedback issues with this particular presentation, so all our questions need to be done at the very end in a very particular way in order to eliminate what just happened. So write your question down. I was unable to hear the question, unfortunately. Okay, well that's helpful. <laughs> Am I coming in clear, by the way? Okay, great. Um, so the third option, and I, I, I want to caveat this by saying it's, it, it may be an option, uh, given the volatility in the markets, this is something that uh, remains to be seen how feasible it is. Up until a month ago, it was uh, very feasible for a lot of cities um, who are have recently or are currently looking to issue bonds to pay off the part of the UAL. So I will touch on this idea, but I will say there would be, um, it's a fairly complex instrument that uh, there would be more due diligence that would uh, be required. But the concept of a pension obligation bond is essentially to convert the 7% debt with CalPERS into uh, bond debt at a lower interest rate. So call it 4% maybe in the current market. And the city would use the money raised through the bond to pay off part of the UAL with CalPERS. So um, really cities have looked at this uh, for, for two primary reasons. One is the, the interest rate differential, uh, those savings, but also the ability to uh, reshape the, uh, the payments in a way that are a bit more affordable. So we depict that in the chart on the right there. Uh, in the orange line. This is uh, purely conceptual, but really goes to, um, you know, creating a new shape that may be more affordable over the long haul. Uh, there is uh, risk associated with pension bonds, and we do have a slide on that, and I'll talk a, a bit in a bit more detail on that in a second. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to slice and dice a, a pension bond. There's a lot of you know, you could take out 20% of your UAL, you could do 100%, you can uh, do a 30 year bond, a 10 year bond. And so um, to keep it simple, just for this first kind of introduction of the concept, what we assumed in this chart on slide 19 is that 75% of the city's UAL was paid off with CalPERS. And then we looked at three different maturities of that debt. So in orange, we have a 15 year bond in uh, teal. We have a 20 year bond and in gray, there's a 25 year bond. And so naturally the longer you would repay 
that would allow the city to uh, pay less annually. That's why the, the gray line is at the lowest level. So you can see that's kind of flat line for the next uh, 26 or so years. And then in the teal, that's a bit higher at the seven, a little over 7 million per year. And then in orange, that's obviously the highest because you're, you're shortening the um, amortization period. So um, the little table there has a breakdown of potential savings. Uh, I'll get into why we call that potential as opposed to um, guaranteed. But uh, when you look at uh, potential savings from a pension bond, uh, you know, it's very easy to say 4% for 7%. There's a lot of savings there. And as you can see from this summary chart, there is a lot of potential savings. That is based on the assumption that CalPERS actually earns 7% for the next 20, 25 years. And so this brings us to um, kind of the, the, the benefits and risks slide. Um, on the right side, I'll start with the risks but, and read that first bullet. But savings is ultimately dependent on future CalPERS returns, which are unknown at the time of issuance. So what this means is that if CalPERS returns are less on average than that 7%, uh, over the duration of the bond. Uh, the savings that we were just looking at are a bit lower. Uh, if they earn more than 7%, those savings are actually higher. Um, the, the rule of thumb is that if CalPERS earns more on that money uh, than you're paying on your pension bond, then the city comes out ahead. So if the city borrows at, let's say, 4% uh, and CalPERS earns Maybe they don't earn seven, but they earn 5.5 or six. There's still uh, a good amount of savings there, but it's not as much as if uh, CalPERS were to have earned 7%. And so this is really the um, one of the primary reasons that we've seen a lot of activity uh, by cities this year uh, and last year in the pension bond market, because when interest rates are low, uh, the likelihood that CalPERS is going to earn more than that rate uh, on their investments is a lot higher as opposed if, uh, as opposed to a situation where you were borrowing at, let's say, 5.5% and CalPERS needed to uh, make more than that 55 uh for there to be savings. So um, this is one of the uh, primary uh, concerns of the uh, GFOA uh, Government Finance Officers Association is that there is um, reinvestment risk with a POB. Um, so we started with the, with the risks. Um, obviously, as, as you saw from the chart, um, some of the benefits uh, of a POB are really the ability to reshape uh, the debt to something more affordable. Uh, there is near-term savings just because you're, you're kind of cutting off that peak in payments that you're currently facing. And then uh, um, there is uh, likely uh, interest rate savings uh, between what CalPERS earns and what the city would pay on a pension bond. And I know we have a, I think we have a, uh, I'm going to turn to slide 22. Um, this actually doesn't mention it, but I, I just want to note that the, um, Pension bond market has, you know, interest rates have ranged from from under three percent recently to to four percent, which is a lot. It's very low uh, historically speaking. Um, given the coronavirus and the shakeup in the in the stock and the bond markets, we have not seen a POB come to market for at least a month now. I know there's probably a couple dozen cities waiting on the sideline, and so it's to be seen whether. Uh, investors will actually buy these pension bonds. So I want to just uh, make crystal clear for the second or third time that uh, this is an idea that uh, may not be feasible right now, just based on the market. Um, uh, something to reassess possibly at a later time in the near future. Um, you know, looking at 22, I think the other reason that uh, a pension bond could be a challenge for the city right now is just given uh, the potential credit rating. Um, most of the POBs done uh, recently are in the AA category or high A category. 
and one of the key uh, uh, reasons uh, in ways to get a higher credit rating is, is liquidity and reserve levels. And so I think as we touched on in the beginning, the city is below its minimum uh, targets for reserves. So I think um, it's really important that the city, uh, both to deal with the unknowns with coronavirus, but also to um, perhaps uh, create opportunities for some of these other options in the future, whether it's bonds for capital projects or pension bonds, uh, is to really focus on the uh, strengthening of the reserve levels and focus on that liquidity. Um, as I mentioned before, and I think uh, your finance director was touching upon this in the previous presentation, I, I had some trouble hearing, but um, you know, we, we have seen a lot of forecasts for different cities and each city is a bit different in terms of the uh, buckets of, of, of revenue that it, it collects. But I think it's, it's clear that um, fourth quarter will be uh, significantly impacted. And then uh, it's really to be seen uh, how much of an impact there's going to be in 21. And so um, I really just, you know, from a high level perspective, I think, you know, prioritizing uh, the city's liquidity uh, and reserve levels uh, would be very, uh, very prudent. And I think as we've talked about, there are ways to uh, continue to uh, address the uh, pension situation uh, while maintaining some of that um, flexibility. And so I think our last slide in conclusion, um, first bullet we just touched on, uh, there's going to be challenges uh, this, this fiscal year and next fiscal year. I think from our perspective, um, you know, a fresh start option, uh, I think in concept is, is good, you know, paying off a UAL early, saving money in the out years is, um, I think is a good objective. I think what we wanted to communicate is that there are other strategies to get to the same point while still maintaining flexibility for the city. And so um, in terms of the pension bond option, I think, as I mentioned, there are various market as well as credit rating uh, potential challenges. So that's something that you, um, if you wanted more information on at a let later date, um, we'll be happy to share more. Um, as part of our recommendation, I think continuing to refine that five to 10 year forecast that Dean was sharing is, is will be very uh, important as you uh, develop strategies for um, dealing with some of these short as well as long term impacts, um, especially on the uh, pension side, as we looked at earlier. Uh, you know, a down year this year is going to not impact the city in the next few years, but come uh, four or five years down the road. Uh, it will be something that um, you'll need to take into account in your projections. And then lastly, um, you know, one, uh, I, you know, the city has, I, I believe, several uh, policies with regards to reserve levels, um, debt management policy. Um, a lot of cities have adopted what's called a pension funding policy to uh, provide some guidelines about how um, you will be going about addressing these liabilities. Um, and we have had some clients actually uh, tailor those a bit more to target um, certain numbers, you know, annually, um, whether that's setting aside of, uh, of surplus monies that would then go to a 115 trust or, or directly to CalPERS. But that is something that the council could uh, think about down the road if you want to put something in place um, that provides some structure to uh, paying down these liabilities moving forward. So I think that's that's it. Um, my, my colleague, Craig Hill, I forgot to introduce him. He's also on the phone. So we're both happy to um, answer questions as they come in. Okay. I, there's a microphone on in here somewhere. Um, Samantha needs to turn that microphone off. Thank you. Anybody else have one on? Okay, so because of how this presentation is being given to us, you will each need to step down from the dais and walk over to the podium that is facing the computer to ask your questions. 
so that he can hear them and we can record them and then return when you're done. So try and take all your questions forward at one time, given the time that it's going to take for us to have these Q&As. So the only reason to turn your light on is to signal to me that you want to go down and ask questions. And I will cue you up and point at you so that I can turn my mic off and reduce all the feedback, OK? Thank you. So with the 115 Trust, if you've got an investor that's not disciplined what guarantee is somebody investing year after year to make sure they, they, they meet the obligation? Meaning the obligation, meaning the long-term uh, unfunded obligation debt being paid off. In terms of the obligation that you're going to be billed for, that's always going to be the uh, CalPERS bill uh, that you're going to have to pay. Uh, in terms of the the 115 trust that's really up to the city uh, in terms of how much it can afford to put in there and how much it wants to put in there. And there are policies that you could put in place to uh, provide guidelines on that. But that money, once it's in, must be used for pension costs or OPEB costs. That's another one. So there, there's no guarantee then I mean, you can set all the policy you want. Uh, we have a reserve fund policy that, that didn't get followed. So that even, even if you set a policy, there's no guarantee of it being paid in. It, the money could be redirected somewhere at any time in a future council, and your unfunded goes willy-nilly kind of like it is now then, right? So you're, <clears throat> you're, you're correct. A policy could be changed, I guess, in the future by a future council, correct? Um, I think that's I think that's what you're asking that you know again that money the money that's in there already uh, again can only be used for pension and OPEB but in terms of changing the policy that's something that the council could um, future councils could 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 amend uh, in terms of your CalPERS bill though and keeping up with your uh, required payments that's something that's separate from the 115 and that will um, be billed to the city by CalPERS every year. Uh, so the 115 is really the above and beyond that the city wants to contribute towards uh, pension or OPEB costs. That does not take the place of what you must pay to CalPERS each year to continue paying your bills. All right, so if there's no further um, questions from council to staff before we move on to public comment. Any questions for staff before we move on? Seeing none, um, I would go ahead and turn your mic back on, Samantha, and we will first look to the room to see if anyone is available for public comment. In the meantime, if you'd like to call, it's 805-875-8201. And remember to turn down your TV, radio, or computer so that we don't get the feedback that you got to experience during our interactions. Seeing no one call, we'll move to written communications. 
There is one written communication from Mr. Ron Fink. Everybody did receive it. It is on the website. It has been available for um, the public as well as council. It's your call if you'd like me to read it. That'll be fine. Thanks for putting it on the website. Still seeing no calls, we'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion. Council Member Starbuck. Yeah. Can we go ahead and continue this item until the 21st meeting? Uh, yes, we can do that. It's, it's I mean, it would be relevant because of the, the teleconference call tomorrow. And no, I'm sure not all of us are going to sit in on the teleconference call and a lot to digest here and just to keep this in the forefront. Yeah, no, that, that would be up to a, the council's discussion. Councilmember Mosey. If that's a motion, I would second it. I will make it a motion then that we continue this till the 21st. Councilmember Cordova. Um, I think it was premature for us to have this communication today. That's why I stressed it at the March meeting that this should have been had in the April, at the April, the second meeting in April. Um, I did have a question for, a couple questions for Dean if he's available. Put your left foot out, right foot in. Go ahead. Um, so, Dean, in your opinion, um, you being the finance director for the city, what is what would be your recommendation if you were looking at the current status of, of, of our budgetary shortfalls and what we're facing in the future? Um, what would be your recommendation? I think right now, to put everything on pause, right now I think everything is crazy. Everybody's putting their hands in our pocket. I mean, you're talking almost $2 million in the, the Family First Care Act and all the other ones, and we don't have funding for those. I have no idea what's going to happen. Interest rates are dropped to nothing. Um, we're, I know we're going to see some impact, but I kind of like to see where, where we're going in the short term to get an idea. But I still would recommend that we aggressively go after paying down that pension debt, um, even if we had to make that payment like we were going on in a 15-year amortization to figure out what we need to do and then make that decision closer shortly after. Thank you. Any more questions or concerns before we vote? Council Member Vega. Yes, I think it's a little premature also that we have this presentation, but we've had this presentation. If you look at the staff report, uh, moving it to the 21st is not necessary uh, because there was no action that was supposed to be taken. We were waiting for the certification of the vote so that we could discuss it, but I think after that, uh, I don't think we need a repeat of it. What we need is to, if there's anything that needs to be revised because of any changes in CalPERS, uh, they need to update us, but we don't need another presentation like this unless we have more questions. But again, if you look at the staff report, council for open discussion, but take no action. So when we come back on the 21st and that vote's certified, we're going to have, be able to have another discussion on the options here. So. I uh, wanted to make that point. If I could, I do think that one thing that Mike brings up that's very a very good idea is that we develop and come forth with a pension payback policy. So if we did have surpluses and there was some money that we could contribute to it, that we come up with a plan of action. But this is something that we can work on you know, after we make this decision where we want to go. And, and if I could state, you know, Dean, um, we're in uncharted waters. Even the financial advisors are giving us their best guess. And I know that's, that's important, uh, but we don't know how long this is going to last. So for us to lock something in long term at this point, you know what I mean, would seem kind of uh, like we, didn't, we haven't done our homework. So sometimes we may need a little bit more time before we obligate ourselves to something that we don't know whether we can afford it and we don't know if it's going to be a benefit interest rate wise or anything. If people aren't buying the bonds because of lack of faith in the market, uh, to go to a pension bond seems to me frivolous because there's no one buying. So that wouldn't work. The other part of it, you could put some guidelines in, you could put some sort of a, uh, as you said, some sort of a policy that said you could spend the money or you could take it out. It sounds like once you put it in, you can't take it out. It sounds like you, you have to, 
to look at your surplus to see what you can afford to pay and be uh, up on top of your minimum payments. And that's where the investment portfolio is built on, if I'm understanding correctly. Correctly, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I understand the motion and the desire, but I think given all the uncertainties we have, that it's more than just CalPERS call tomorrow and what their potential adjustment is, given the stock market, given COVID-19, given all the changes that the governor is making regarding sales tax and the decisions we've made about delaying TOT, I would ask Council Member Starbuck to consider the final week, the final meeting in May as the opportunity to discuss this because by then we might actually see more information rather than just two weeks from now because this is such an every day something new is happening. I'll make a comment. This isn't to pass anything on the 21st. We're having a, a teleconference with CalPERS tomorrow. If we don't want anybody to know other than what we receive as an email from Mr. Troop, then we don't do anything on the 21st and we'd bring it in May. If we want the public to know and we want to keep this on the forefront, then we would have an update on the 21st of May. Decisions don't have to be made because it's on an agenda. That's why I said continue. We didn't use words like table or anything. It's to keep us informed. It's an open discussion and it's open so the public can know what's happened. That's all that we're asking for. To make the decision on what we're gonna do with the tax money on the 21st would be absolutely asinine, and I wouldn't support that. All I want is to have an agenda item so we can speak of it. So I'm gonna retain my motion. Thank you for your clarification, Council Member Mosby. I'll, I'll ditto what he said. Um, I had a couple questions for Mr. Alba real fast. There's been some concern of, about where information is on the pension obligation in different books. I know the CAFER has quite a few pages referencing. Maybe you could, for the record, for the public who wants to chime in and find out where this is. Um, yeah, you can dig into CalPERS. There's tons of information out there. I mean, you can go to uh, the basic financials, the net position it's called. Um, I think it's page 42. Page 42. You can see what the uh, net position is for the city and in governmental and, and business ones. You can drill down on that. You can look at all the major utilities, go, I think it's page 56, 58, and you can look at the financials for the utilities and see what's allocated to each one of those. Um, if you wanna dig down even deeper, there's a whole note, there's about 15 pages, it's note six that talks about CalPERS. It's basically a summary of what's in the actual reports and valuations. We probably put it in language that people can understand. Um, there's also in the back um, a comparative year over year where trends are happening, you can see that there. Um, it's also, this is all public knowledge. You can go to CalPERS and you can dig real deep into a hundred page actuarial report that'll give you more information and, and make you more confused than you ever been. But it's, there's tons of information out there if you want. It's all public knowledge and it's readily available to anyone. Thank you. Council Member Vega. Mayor, I understand the motion and uh, along with the motion, if it's just an open discussion or asking for an update, um, whatever we've learned up to the April 21st uh, meeting, I, I can see this, but it would be with no action to be taken, just as we have in our staff report here. So if we do get an update on the 21st, which I expect we will anyhow, regardless of the motion, uh, it'll be uh, something that's brought up, but no action is expected to be taken on April 21st. We're just looking for an update. I think that's what, Star, if that's what you're looking for, Council, Councilman Starbuck, that, but we don't want any action to be taken. No, absolutely not. That, not especially not the 21st. Council Member Mosby. I mean, there might be an action to continue or bring something back, but no action of spending the money. And that's not my intention of placing, but I think this is something that we, we need to be bringing back routinely. So if we see something there, I mean, I might be making an action that we come back to analyze something or to bring some more numbers forward, but not, I have no intentions all, we, we're, we're far from um, seeing all the angles that are out there yet. So I'm not, yeah. I'm talking about placing the money, no, but we might ask uh, for more ins information or for it to come back at another, another date. Council Member Vega. Yeah, again, I get it. And what I'm saying is 
I think you always have the option of saying, hey, we want a continuance or to bring it back because it's the identical thing that we're doing today. We're asking for and somebody's making a motion. So I understand you, but I think we always have that option and by saying no action to be taken, I think it's identical to what the way the agendized item is here. So I don't think there's any changes there, guys. So I'm gonna stick with asking for no action to be taken because that's the way this agendized item is written and no one's curtailing us and keeping us from actually uh, extending it or asking for another update or asking for more information. All right, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, we've had discussion and so let's vote. And that passes for one. The next item is status report on utility shutoff moratorium, waiver of delinquent utility fees, and closure of Civic Center lobby for bill payments due to COVID-19 pandemic, city council consideration of any additional assistance to utility rate payers. And we have Melinda Wall to give the presentation. Just real quick. Thank you, Dean. Yes. Okay, so we're done with uh, all set. So thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I just want to give you a, a brief update. What we have here is some information that you were requesting at the time on the um, when you had your March 17th meeting. You asked to have uh, information um, about what's going on with the Treasury and Utility Billing Division, and um, we're recommending the continuation of the measures in place by maintaining the closed uh, lobby door for the Civic Center and the Treasury uh, Utility Billing Division. And it's basically what I'm just going to talk about is the utility and treasury portion of this, and so. Also, we ask if you consider and make any recommendations and uh, provide additional alternative direction. So on March 17th, the City Council adopted a plan to place into moratorium something similar to PG&E, which suspended delinquency payments, delinquency fees and turnoffs. The City Council also allowed a closure of City Hall lobby doors for 60 days at that time they asked us to come back in three weeks so this report was developed in two weeks um, for the Treasury and utility billing and so what we've shown in the report um, because it was very clear that the City Council wanted to make sure that the public had good um, customer service and you've allowed us to take additional measures to make sure everybody in City Hall and outside of City Hall don't cross that barrier line to get um, a possible contamination by the COVID virus. Um, I put into the staff report a picture of the phone that we've put in place in front of the lobby doors, um, which can contact staff right then and there. And Additionally, we put envelopes for the utility payments, um, payment assistance information in both English and Spanish outside the front door. We've, we have the payment assistance information and a lot more on the stand. We have some of it in English and Spanish. Um, we also made the forms that are available on the city website something that they could fill in before they were just uh, Adobe PDF. So we've made it so that they can actually fill in the document there and then email it to the city. Um, we've go, we go and make sure that the drop box is checked three or four five times a day and make sure that there are plenty of envelopes available for people that come to the counter. So I have, some information that Brandy gave me today. Um, in the report, we talk about the fact that we've gotten over 
3,000 phone calls in the first two weeks. And this last week, we've gotten another 1,500. Um, and Brandy made me a list, and it was very comprehensive of everything that's going on. And uh, with your indulgence, I'd like just to read through it. Some of it's going to be a repeat of what's in my report, but um, she uh, wanted to make sure that you, were, you realize that we understand the need to give the public all the information they need while trying to keep everybody safe. So, again, she put documents in stand outside the glass door for utility applications, utility disconnect forms, large envelopes put documents in, return envelopes for payments, direct debit withdrawal application, medical forms, rate assistant applications, um, HEAP applications, COVID-19 information. We posted signs with telephone numbers of contract staff, which they can do right there in the front door. They, um, they made our forms fillable, and now they're online. Uh, IS removed the delinquency charges from bills and are tracking the amounts. They're working with uh, Richard Grasick uh, to make sure that the messages on the phones are complete. They've actually made two videos and put them online to the website and the Facebook page to inform customers where they can get forms, drop payments, and uh, find information. They have met with customers at the door to give and receive applications, take cash payments. Staff even helped a customer complete their application. Um, they sent ser uh, customer service field technicians to develop, to deliver the heap forms to customers that are handicapped or couldn't get out. Um, again, they've created flyers in English and Spanish to inform customers to sign up for HEAP. The really important thing about HEAP is that they've infused a lot of money into it uh, more than they usually have through this program. And they were talking also, do, additionally, if they go through another, um, public, another bill in Congress that they want to put even more money into HEAP to give people enough funding to pay their electric bill. Um, I should mention that the, the HEAP is for low-income housing assistance programs. Um, so they fax bills to social services to help customers get assistance quickly. They added a bill message to the April bills. They mailed forms to customers if they could not picked them up here and called us that we sent those out. Uh, we've been in contact with the CAC about how customers can reach them while their office is closed. Um, they're still billing and sending late notices, but not sending termination notices. Billing and connections are answering phones and returning calls. Uh, so far, as records that we've seen that we've answered every phone call we've been able to return. There have been a couple people that have left messages without um, giving us their name and number, so sometimes that's kind of hard, or it's not legible, so it's hard to get back to them. Um, they're still taking personal payments for customers and the, for building permits and planning, and they're assisting customers how to access uh, information, offering extension plans that they, that they want to, to, even though we've told them we're not doing any turnoffs. Some people say, well, I'd still like to put a plan in place so that I know I'm, you know, I can't make it this time, but um, they'll be able to keep going. And that's, that's about that. The breakdown of um, the number of utility payments between 318 and 331, which is kind of a two week period, we received um, 4,972 payments. Um, the updated information for between 4.1 and 4.6, we actually received, uh, and this isn't in your report, but we received uh, 3,746 payments. So that's more than what we had received in the two, maybe per week than we received in two weeks. Uh, it's been pretty successful with the, let me get back to this. So um, just getting back to what we're doing here, 
there, daily we've sent out an internal email to all staff to let them know exactly who's available and to make sure that the phone calls get into the right departments, the right to staff for contacts. Um, we've had really good uh, customer support. The public's been really good. We've only had one or two people that are you know, upset about not being able to hand someone the cash. In those cases, we'll make an, a special appointment that they can come, you know, they can, we can take it to them, providing them hand sanitizer as we do that. Um, it's not the greatest way of doing it, but we can understand people that don't want to make, do money orders or have anything else. But um, it's, we really appreciate the public support and all that they've given to us. We're taking uh, staff logs of how many phone calls have been taken in and how many have been called back. And the uh, first chart just kind of shows that uh, how many accounts it affects for the transfers, ons, and offs for utility billing. And the total trips are the trips that the, the customer service uh, workers go out to. Um, we talk, there was a question concerning payments and how, how citizens are making their payments. So we have a little chart here of saying this is for the two weeks of March 18th and March 30, 30th. Um, I won't go in, into all of them, but it, you, you can see that they've taken online payments through our website. Pay mode X, that's when the um, Customer pays their bill through their banking services. So if you have a bank, you can make payments through that, um, through the Dropbox, mail. Uh, ECP is our electronic customer payment. It's a direct deposit that we, customers are giving us the authority to draw down on their account and by phone and internally. So all in all, the first, uh, it's kind of amazing that um, we're still getting, just say on um, 4-6 as an example, we had um, 1,333 payments that day. Uh, it's the first of the month, we get a lot more payments in the beginning of the month, toward, then towards the end of the month. But um, we had uh, 412 were Dropbox, 383 were um, mail payments, the uh, payment through bank was 205, phone payments were 225, uh, pay mode X there was 67, and online payments there was 37. So all in all, it's, it, it has been successful. It's been um, very pleased. We try to make sure that um, people understood, so on the back of the bill we put in the fact that the delinquent fees will be waived during the months of March and April, and utilities will not be shut off through May. Um, we've given specific phone numbers for whether they want to cancel their service, where they want to start a service, um, and again, it's online so that people can contact us that way. Just to, as a reminder, through um, Through our utility billing rules, the city already has policies in place for making uh, payment arrangements. And then in February, we passed the 998 policy where the water wouldn't be turned off for at least 60 days. Um, and so that, that modification had been made in February. Again, any modification that the council wants, um, the finance director um, has, sorry, city, <laughs> sorry, um, has the ability to make policy for, for uh, payments arrangements. I just want to point out again that uh, KEEP is a really great program and we've been really encouraging people to go forward and apply for that. They can get from 100 to to $1,000 off to pay in, based on their their income and their needs, and there's a whole policy in place 
on uh, through the uh, Community Action Commission, the CIC, to fill those out. Um, just wanted to point out for any kind of thoughts that you were looking through, just a reminder that water, wastewater, and solid waste are all subject to Prop 218. So if there's any deviations in the rates for that, that might be something that would have to go back to the voters and get approved. Um, and there was a, a question about concerning when we get the mu new Munis system on board for utility billing about the phone calls. Um, it, the issue about the phone calls is not that this, that we couldn't handle it, it's a security issue. It's called a red flag. And the, the system we have right now is the older technology and it's okay until we upgrade our software. And at that time we have to have a newer technology and federal re regulations say that you need to have identification when you're making payment. And that's why um, continuing phone payment, take, uh, taking credit cards over the, the um, phone is not a good thing on a security level for us. And this is something by the feds, it's not something that we wanna do, but it's something that if we get to, to, to the new uh, software and the new um, the way they take payments, you actually have to show your ID and um, pass your card through. Uh, Um, I just want to let you know also that we had some Excel temps that were working for us and a um, part-timer and they have all been furloughed just because of the liability issues that would, you know, if they got sick and covering them and there have been a whole bunch of changes with uh, COVID-19 and how the regular city employees were going to get uh, additional two weeks and they're still developing all the guidelines and it's changing every day so I don't really have information to share with you but they're working at um, two weeks of pay uh, for sick pay just for COVID-19 separate from the pay that they're they're getting right now through our sick stuff um, sick leave accrual and that's all on us that's our responsibility to pay for that if we were a private um, entity and had tax returns, that would be a tax credit on when they fill, file their taxes. However, we're a public entity, and uh, that's something that we will have to absorb if we have anyone using that COVID-19 sick pay. And they're also doing a sick pay um, based on children you have at home that individuals can get uh, two thirds of their salary for up to 10 weeks after the regular two weeks for the COVID-19. And again, that's something that the city is absorbing. And I just wanted to, to mention that President Trump wanted to get everyone back to, to work by April 12th and has pushed that back to April, the end of April. Um, but they're saying that the, probably the COVID curve for us is going to be somewhere between April 24th and July 26th. So there's a huge period of time that, uh, that we're not on the same page. Oh, sorry, April 26th through July 28th. Um, at the time that I worked on this report, we had 10 cases in the city of Lompoc and the surrounding areas. And I realize that some of that might be with the, the prison, but I'm not sure what numbers they were quoting at that time. But so that was as of um, March 31st. And now, um, now it's up to 37 confirmed cases in the city of Lompoc and surrounding community. Um, so we're no near, we're not near our peak yet of the exposure level um, countywide, they had uh, at the time that I created the report, they had 99 cases and now it's 192 cases. Um, so, so far, the fiscal impact um, we only looked at 
the delinquent charges that we waived. Um, for the two groups that have been processed so far, it was 10,268. Kind of did a simple math, a doubling it that, so that be about $2,000 that um, we haven't collected. Revenues um, from four groups, it's usually about 4.7 million. I do want to say that um, I expect some changes as far as garbage services for uh, commercial businesses. We've had uh, several businesses have stopped because they're not engaged anymore and they, or they've gone down just to one can versus three cans five times a week. Or um, So it's a big change and also I think you'll see in the a disposal part of this I do know that I've told that electric, you probably get 20% uh, 20, 20 more in residential usage because people are at home. I just want to also point out that commercial, a lot of the shops are closed, so they're not going to be using as much water or electricity or, um, or, or solid waste. Wastewater is a fixed rate for a year, so that's going to be the same and at that point I'm going to stop and ask if you have any questions not to depress anyone but the numbers as of this evening were actually 55 for Lompoc with um, 35 of those being at the prison and we're up to 218 cases so we're actually higher than that so um, the numbers are continuing to grow so yes that that was after Five o'clock today that they posted them. Um, <laughs> Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, Mr. Troop, I'd like to thank you for the last line on the on the agenda item. City Council consideration of any additional assistance to utility ratepayers. Um, a couple of, the, of things I'd like to throw out here. I've talked with Mr. Albro a couple of times about this, so it's one of them is is a possible customer credit out of our electric. Now, Mr. Albro and I have beat this back and forth a lot. I was looking to spend 7% of our total fund balance in the reserves, and obviously the, the, the management services director doesn't want to do that much. Uh, the other question I wanted to bring up was repayment or payment options after this. If we have them, you say that they're in place, uh, management services director can make the payment options, but what are they? We hear it, but none of us know. But I think the argument here is, what can we, the city, do for our ratepayers? And I, I want to stay out of all of the funds with the exception of the electric. Electric is funded. We, we, we have our reserve there. The people that have paid to make the reserve whole would be the ones that would receive the benefit. Obviously, the municipality would not pay, which is roughly a 10% of our electric. There's been really no growth in the commercial or residential since the figures had come up before. Give a little back. And I think at this point, maybe the, the discussion in the management services director's office, we could bring it out here on the dais right now and talk about why not 100 and why we want to do less. So, yeah, I'd love, love you to say something. Let me just say something real quick, though. Um, I'd like to have, I hate to say this, I'd like to have you wait until you find out what the fourth stimulus package will be because they're talking about throwing more money into the heat. And, yeah, that's low income. And I know some businesses are hurting. But they're, so they're talking about um, looking at what they can do for businesses and and um, individuals. So do, do, one thing to consider is, do you want it just for those that are on, under low income? you want it for everybody? I was going to go across the board. Everybody pays the bill, so everybody's contributed to the reserve. You wait around for a stimulus. It's, it's, we'll never see it. We haven't seen it for a while. This would be an immediate relief, a little bit of relief. I mean, we're not taking, talking about paying everybody's whole bill here. But the people that would benefit the most are the ones that are going to appreciate the small stimulus that we could offer them. 
Well, I mean, to add to the conversation, I think that um, I, I talked to Tekin and we were looking at the numbers and, and what is happening from the COVID. Um, obviously, we're seeing way down numbers for our commercial um, people. Um, like Melinda said, that, that part of the stimulus, they're trying to work something out to help out those businesses get, you know, bridge through this gap. Um, the, the projection is that the residential people will probably see about a 25% increase in their electric bill uh, because of them staying at home and using their utilities versus going to work. Um, that means that the average uh, utility bill for electric is probably about $50. So if you added and gave a, you know, a one-time reduction of 25% to make them whole, you're probably talking 1250 or, you know, uh, a credit, but you could make it some other number if you thought that would be over a duration of, let's say two months or whatever we're talking about. But I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of with Melinda too. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what they're giving away. And, and I know where we're gonna get hit. I talked about the CalPERS number. When you talk about a $20 million reduction in our unfunded or increase in our unfunded liability, you know, 10% of that is the electric division. So you're talking a $2 million hit to the electric division. And not to mention that they they have really good reserves, so they're going to get hit probably three or four hundred thousand in lost earnings from those drops by the Federal Reserve to zero. It's going to hit us all. It's going to hit all our funds. Sure. So yeah, I, I would recommend you keep it low and like Melinda said, see what happens in in the next stimulus. If they don't address it, then we could always bring it back. But um, well, it yeah. was just kind of, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I mean, we looked at numbers before 13,000 residents and 1,700 commercial accounts. These are all round numbers. It came out at one and a half million or 7% of the reserve is roughly. You know, is that a bad thing to give that back? And that was at a hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of people who, um, a lot of people, their bills $10 a month. There's a lot of people that do that. They'd make out. They 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 just live on the heat menu basically. Yeah, the guy that's paying twenty two yeah, two thousand you know, the hundred dollars a is year nothing. of their bill. <laughs> yeah, I, I just it it just seems like it would be a sensible thing to try and do, or at least a good gesture from us. Yeah, and also keep in mind um, the, the electric division has approximately a twenty million dollar. And if you say, okay, the 20 million is their expense, they're 100% funded, well, it doesn't really work that way with electric. Electric's a little unique. We have 13 to 14 million that we have to keep in uh, a reserve account. That's why we have such a large yeah. reserve. So if you were to take all that away uh, for the NCPA reserve fund that we have, you're, you're, you're much lower to like 30 to 40%. So in, in what I'm talking about, that 2 million hit, it's gonna bring us down to below probably our minimum. So. We just got to be cautious on what we're doing because I'm, I'm a little concerned on what we're seeing in, you know, ahead of us, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. To be honest, I don't know what's going to happen. I'll kind of drop this, and if council wants to pick it up and discuss it, so be it. I'm going to move on to the what kind of payment arrangements do you arrange for people? I'm going to let Melinda because I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, she said you do it. <laughs> he, has, he has the authority to set what we're what we're doing but what our practice is currently if someone wants to make payment arrangements we ask them to pay 10 percent of the bill that's outstanding and then take the rest of it and, and prorate it over the um because they have to be at least two or three months late before they need to make a payment arrangement plan so they have 10 percent down it goes on for 10 months after that 10 months so they get it paid within a year now we could make that longer if you want. Um, but it, in a year, they should be able to catch up. And we wouldn't do it during this period of time at all. We would like, when we go back to the fact that we're going to start putting on the delinquency payments and getting ready for shutoff, we're going to That's go the part I wanted to address is, is when somebody gets to that point, you know, when they maybe just get their job back and then all of a sudden they've got a a huge bill in front of them. I mean, is there so you, the authority go to where you could do that for two years? You can suggest years, to us that you want it to start at a certain point and go for um, the 12 months, and or if they need longer, to make a payment arrangement for 18 months or, or two years. And we can extend it out that far. Because it seems like it's a very discretionary it is. thing here. Especially so. with a um, nine, 
998, the policy we had adopted in uh, uh, February because they didn't want anybody's water, water to be turned, turned off. off. Right. So there, you have to wait at least 60 days. So whenever that clock starts where President Trump says that everyone should return to work and all the governors agree with it, then at that point, I think um, our governor, Gavin, said he wanted to wait till June first or the end of May, but that might be pushed back too. So that whenever we start the clock, we can set up that time frame. Okay, you got 60 days to bring your balanced current. I've been really um, amazed that the people still paying their bills. You know, they're not not paying their bills. So the fact yeah. that we got so many payments within you know this yeah, last week. That's, that's now. Yeah. If this goes on. I totally understand that. Before I turn off my light here, yeah. if this doesn't gain any traction or momentum, when would be the best time for me to re-bring this up? Um, well, I know you're going to have to bring back in the 60 days, May 16th, you know, um, if you're going to continue it for another 60 days or what you're going to do. Um, so the council meeting before that, I think, is the May 5th meeting. I don't know if you guys would have a special meeting yeah. if you needed to proclaim this a continued emergency or not. But at that time, you could determine that's when you want to, you know, set up guidelines. Council Member Vega. I'd like to address it now. Uh, it's already agendized as far as changing policies and it can be readjusted and changed because the current policy doesn't work. We're already in a pandemic um, area. We already have a uh, deemed uh, an emergency state, state of emergency. Um, so I think that some of the suggestions that you said about extending the payment, uh, the payment time frame out to 18 months, two years, once we get to that point, there's many people that are home uh, sick. There's people that can't go to work because they have kids at home. School's been shut down. There's a, there's a long line of things that, that we just don't know the answer to. So I think that we should have been the policy to make it more lenient right now. My concern is there's people there that were already having a hardship. So I think what we're doing here is because everyone's impacted now, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, bring everybody kind of like a fresh start. Everyone has to pay. There's no waiver of fees, but it's up to the city to make a policy that allows everyone to get back um, back to square one. So again, the 18 months that you suggested or the two years, depending on when we get back, we need to work on, uh, and maybe I could ask you guys to bring back uh, through a motion, uh, a change in policy for a repayment. We have to look at that. People right now that are stressed uh, because, and we can't deal with anything because it says they won't, the government won't help anybody with a population of city less than 500,000. I said what I, I think that, uh, I guess my question would be is if we put a policy in there that asks for a waiver or a hardship of fees, since we're a financially distressed city anyway, anyhow, is there a means from us to get reimbursed uh, by the government because of the hardships that the extra hardships we're facing because we are Lompoc. We were already deemed on the finan financially distressed list aside from the pandemic. So I'm wondering if there's another avenue that once we set a policy that, hey, we have people here that are gonna need a waiver of fees or, or can't get back up depending on the length of time, there should be maybe a reimbursement from the city. Uh, I'm following Councilman Starbucks' lead that maybe there's a way of giving back to help everybody get back on their feet if we can get it from the government or the state. But we may have to have a policy change in place instead of just waiting for us to uh, get out of this and then just ask for the ratepayers to pay up. I'm not an advocate of taking from the reserves. Uh, we heard from the financial consultant that uh, depleting our reserves also push, puts us in a different credit rating. I don't want to distress our city any more than we have. I wouldn't give out any money that we don't have that we don't know that we're going to need. I think that reserve needs to stay in place and we need to find other alternatives from which to help the public because uh, right now everyone is stressed, including the city. All of us are pretty much stressed, okay? It's changed our lifestyle. Uh, we're worried about our health, but then again, we're empowered with uh, being essential because 
We're here to make sure the general health of the city is being maintained by providing water, wastewater, electricity to make sure, so we're essential. So someone needs to stay out here and fix it, and that's why I applaud every, each and every one of you and staff uh, to say, hey, we're here to help, but we don't want to get sick either, okay? So what's, and, and I said that word, I said I wasn't going to say it, but um, so again, I'd like to make some sort of a policy change or a recommendation here if somebody would follow. Uh, you could come back with a couple of alternatives uh, for us at another meeting. It doesn't have to be tonight so that we can at least have something in place that can be, it's like goal, we can change it, it's flexible. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. Okay. The other question that I have here is, the bills that are coming out, are they still explaining that you're in default? Have the, has the rhetoric been changed? Because I've, I just have been getting calls at my office, uh, people worried about the yellow slips in the bills. I know that's probably not gonna change, but what are we gonna do with people that already had a hardship, this thing hit, and they're worried because some of them don't understand? The, the process. The other part is the website, the city website is also leading people to pay by charge card. It's another question. And they're saying the charge card company or whoever is being, you're being charged a processing fee. Yes. Yes. So if that's, maybe we need a, we have some other options that are available now. Uh, maybe the website, if it hasn't, and I'm just asking a question to see if they're are there other options that are being presented? Because some people are concerned. Hey, we're getting penalized and we're the ones paying. But I get it. The charge card companies have a fee of their own. Yeah. But if the website is not listing all the options, and I'm, I'm just asking. So when they do pay online, the 3% is, is part of the fees. And so that is um, paid by the general fund. And it, that, uh, that 3%... Um, reimburses the general fund for the charges that were charged for credit cards. So the um, people that are, being, that are paying their bill, they're charged the fee as if we're in a normal situation, but the people that don't pay get their late fees waived. Is that what you're saying? Say, um, the late fees, yeah, are waived. Uh, I, I get for, it, yeah. it's a different name and it's still a charge. Um, I really believe that we need to come up with something here that is going to help relieve the stress on the public. Councilman Starbuck, I, I applaud him for asking for some sort of relief from people uh, so they're not stressed out, but I don't agree with uh, taking it out of the reserves. I don't think that we need to uh, weaken our city situation anymore. Uh, so we need some help right here so that we can see what the rhetoric might be on a bill or if they're still getting yellow slips. I just saw one yesterday, a lady came in and it showed me that, hey, you are in default, uh, you're gonna get terminated. So she brought in her light and water bill to me yesterday. It shouldn't say they would be terminated. Well, whatever the rhetoric was, it was this letting you know you could be turned off at any time or something like and, that. And that's because we don't have a clear date when the city council's But what are we going to do to, we're in a, in a situation here that we need to do an outreach to the public. Just sitting here on TV and telling them everything's going to be okay. It reminds me of the banks that people are asking for some relief from their mortgage payments or the renters, and so they call it a forbearance program. But there's a fear factor out there that at the end of that forbearance program, regardless if you're at work or not, you could get your homes foreclosed on. So I think that we can do a better job here as a city uh, as far as their utilities. Yeah, I, un I understand your desire. Right now we have the date that you've basically given us until the end of May, till May 16th actually, because you have a 60 day emergency in place and you won't be able to renew that to your um, closer to that date. Um, Mayor, so if I may interrupt real quick, sorry, sorry Melinda. No. Um, so Christy, who's our CDBG expert, has said that there is a possibility that we could use some CDBG money that would provide housing assistant payments for rent, mortgage, utilities for up to 24 months. So if we come back with another staff report, we can vet this out to bring forth how we can use some of our CDBG funds to do what I think everyone's talking about here. That would be great, Jim. I mean, we're looking for some sort of relief and some sort of positive, positive mes message besides rhetoric here that uh, doesn't deplete our city finances and general fund, but sometimes, we have the ability to give a discount. I believe the city is going to be eligible for funds from the federal government. The idea is if you get money from the federal government, 
we need a set of policies that we're going to give some of that back so that we can relieve some of the stresses. Some of the rhetoric that's on these bills is, is incorrect. We shouldn't be stressing them out by saying, hey, you're gonna get turned off and all this. Right now, we need to put some message up there that says we're in a pandemic stage. Yes, that we have a forbearance program uh, and we are working on a, a repayment program, uh, but I think people need to be worried about more than uh, about their families right now and their health and the fact that they don't have any money. I had a lady call me yesterday and she called me yesterday and she said, uh, she was a server, she was a server in a restaurant. And as you know, servers in restaurants don't live on their wages. They used to live on their tips, so that's a big deal. So even if they were to get unemployment, it wouldn't be enough for them to pay their rent and your utility bill. She asked me yesterday, it's due today, is it gonna get turned off? This is yesterday, and so this is real. Um, so it's not gonna take care of everything. You know, It's too bad that the stimulus package that's being sent out also doesn't come out with a little letter to be responsible with your money, you know, but so that uh, some of the bills get paid also. But we need to change our rhetoric. I don't agree with, or, or I'm asking if there's a way of changing the way our bills come out during this pandemic session or during this time frame. We don't know if it's gonna last six months. To get a yellow slip every month for six months uh, is stressful for people that have no income or they're staying at home with their families. I have a girl that works for me and she had to stay home. Her kids are you know, out of school, no babysitter. There, there's, other, there's a lot of situations out there. And, and as you said, uh, electric bills and utility rates may be going up 10 or 20% because people are home with the lights on all day and all night. That's gonna provide some added stress to their, uh, their ability to pay. So what do I need to do right here? Make a motion? That we come, that uh, I'd like to make a motion. No, if we I need can. to finish our discussion, go to public comment, and then come back and potentially. Thank you so motion. much, but I would like to do that. Thank you. Sure. Um, any more questions for staff before we take public comment? Seeing none, we will now open the floor for public comment. If you'd like to call in, again, the number is 805 875 8201. And remember to turn down your TV, radio, or computer um, once your call comes through. We'll open the floor for those in room. Seeing no one in the room, we will go to the phones. While we wait to see if anyone calls, we will ask about written. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes for public comment. Hi, thank you. My name is Robin. I actually work for the City of Lompoc Billing Department. And I just wanted to clarify a couple of things that were said. Um, we do have payment plans available. Um, we are encouraging people to pay what they can in the meantime before we go back to whatever our routine, whatever normal is so that they can bring those balances down because our payment plans work where we have the customer pay um, 10 or 20% down of the balance, that's to bring it down. And then for instance, if they have a, a balance at that time of $500, we ask them to pay their current bill each month plus $50. If their balance is 1,000, then that extra amount is 100. Now what the ladies in billing have been telling customers through this COVID-19 is that we're going to work with them. We don't want them to panic if, you know, paying that extra $100 is really going to be difficult. Obviously, we want to help them and extend that time out. You know, we like to have them paid within a year, but if we can't and we need a few more months, we're willing to do that with them. And um, a lot of the people have chosen to wait until um, we go back to our normal time to set up that contract in an effort to try to bring that balance down. So we've had very good response. Most customers wish us well, ask us to stay healthy, and are grateful for the assistance that we've given them so far. In regards to the yellow notices, those are late notices. They are not termination notices. They're just a reminder to the people that they do have not just a current balance but a past due. I don't know that there's any wordage on there that says termination. If so, it may be hard coded into it. But if council wants to instruct us to not send yellow notices and just send out bills, 
that's certainly no problem um, with us. I agree, we've had a few customers concerned about those yellow notices. Um, but we, again, have just done whatever we can to encourage people to pay what you can. We understand the situation and we are directing everyone to the HEAT program. And on that one, also, a lot of people don't qualify normally, but because of the loss of their jobs or the reduction in their hours, the CAC is only requesting pay stubs for the last 30 days. So a lot of those people will qualify now, even though three months ago they did not. So we do encourage people to try. It doesn't hurt to try. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hi, uh, my name is Ruben. Um, I just want to comment on uh, the stress that this this is all putting on small businesses. Um, my girlfriend owns a dog grooming salon in Lompoc, or here in town, and um, she's, she's still required to pay her, her monthly rent to her landlord, and but she has no money coming in to be able to support the business. So... Um, we just want to know if there's going to be some sort of help or, 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 or is there a way that um, those fees can get way, uh, waived for the months that the, uh, this is going to last. Um, we, just, we just want to stay above water here. Um, we have to pay rent at home, uh, also our bills, take care of our child, and, and also keep the business afloat. Otherwise, she's going to be forced to close, and we're going to lose that source of income. Um, we just need some help on this. Um, she's a, tried to apply for a small business loan, but there's no no clear um, site or clear way of how to go about it or how to receive that loan. Um, we just need some insight. Um, thank you. Thank you. No more calls? We will close public comment on this matter and bring it back to council. Councilmember Mosby. Melinda, you know, I had uh, quite a few calls the last week or two, and I, I've got to say, nobody's called to complain about you guys, so good job. <laughs> um, and I, I, I did have uh, on my Facebook Live, I did have one of the employees call in and did answer a question for the people helping to direct them to that. So kudos, and uh, I, I know it's tough what you guys had to do and having those closures there. I see the frustration people coming up to those doors and such, and having that phone there seems to mellow them out a little bit, so. It has helped, yeah. that was a good suggestion. Tell them all good job. Thank you. So, um, I appreciate Council Member Starbuck's recommendation, and I think it's something we should look into in the future as to what sort of credits we might be able to go backwards to, but given all of the moving pieces and knowing the impact to our own finances that is already occurring, it's something that again, we should probably look at um, later in, in May when we have to readdress all of this. And I do appreciate Council Member Vega's recommendations and would look to hear um, his motion if he would still like to make it. Thank you. I get emotional because I do care about the people and I'm getting lots of calls as we all do care. So I'd like to thank you guys at the utility department. The last caller, Robin, thank you so much. Uh, it sounds like we're all on the same page. We're just looking for some sort of relief. Uh, the heat program, there's, uh, there, there's different programs that people may not qualify for at this time. So we're looking for something internal. So, uh, my motion would be to ask staff to bring back uh, two or three options on how we can expand our repayment program. It can be pliable, it can be changeable, but we need to do something and expand a little bit more than what we have just because of this pandemic that we don't know when we're gonna get out of it. So it'd be nice to provide some sort of relief to the, to the, uh, to the citizens here that the city is here to help. We don't know, we don't have a timeline, uh, but we're here to be flexible. We're not here to turn off your utilities. Um, the yellow slips, I don't know what we can do about that, Melinda. I mean, I get it. People are gonna be behind on payments. Um, maybe we need to 
take a look at maybe some of the rhetoric that's on there. I don't, the, it's not the yellow slip that bothers me, I think that, or bothers other people. I think uh, the fact that maybe there's not enough of a, uh, maybe an explanation about check with your local or whatever for a repayment program, but, or, or maybe it's people that can pay at this time, but they can't pay the full amount. And I'm sure you would welcome, you know, even a partial payment or 90% of the payment or 80% of the payment so that they can stay current and they only owe uh, possibly another payment by the end, by the time we get out of this. You know, as the last caller mentioned, there are people with hardships in business that are looking for that secondary income and I'd like to provide some sort of hope for them that we're gonna be there to help them uh, when this thing all comes up. So that's my motion that we have city staff come back with some options here for expanding our repayment program. Uh, it's not, a, I'm not asking for a waiver, uh, but uh, I think we can expand on, you mentioned a couple of uh, possibilities, Melinda. Um, if we could do that the next meeting, that'd be great. Mayor, can I add one more, Council Member Vega? Yes, Did sir. you want the CDBG option? In the CDBG option, which is a great option, thank you, Christy. Um, I thought you were standing there so you could uh, tell me something else, but thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So that's my motion. Uh, repayment option, uh, Mayor, and, uh, and the CDBG option also. Thank you, Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, I want to second that, but I just wanted to kind of narrow down the whole thing to what I was seconding, the CDBG option and the method of repayments that the main meat of the motion is that? Yes, sir, and, and possibly they could come back with some recommendations on possibly the bill. Uh, you don't have to change it from yellow, but maybe let's take a look, or you guys can take a look at the rhetoric and see if there's something we can put, you know, due to the pandemic, you know, we understand. We well, care. to keep it moving forward, I'll give you a second on this. Thank you. I think for clarity, to, to help you, that it's maybe, maybe if it's set in the system that instead of it being printed on yellow, maybe not printed on yellow, and have the additional sheet inserted that has gone out about options. So I get the reminder needs to go out and that people need to be warned that they are building a deficit, but having an in, not having it on yellow so it doesn't cause the panic when you open the envelope. Um, and then the second part to that is, I know we've created an insert that describes what we're doing, and so putting that in as a, as a tool to help them might be the easiest solution without worrying about the verbiage of the actual document. So that, you okay with that? Perfect, I'm, right. I'm okay with that. Mayor, if we can, sorry to interrupt one more time. Um, so on the yellow piece, as Robin, who's on the phone, said some of these things are hard-coded. Yeah. Let us, we'll look into it and whatever we do find out, if, we, if there's nothing we can do to change except for just cutting the yellow bill going, the yellow reminder going out, we'll bring forth whether it's you know, how much would it cost? Because if it's hard coded, then you have all the programming costs. It might might be better just to remove that for right now or something. Sure, but we'll, which is we'll why I suggested back. just maybe not doing it in yellow and inserting yeah. an information sheet if you still the, need The to yellow put it. forms are basically printed out, so we'd have to order new forms and it would take Got it. three to yeah. four weeks. All right. So, but, See, but, that was a quick answer on that one. Thank you. All right, so you'll look into that and we'll just add that to that batch of information. All right, so it's been moved, it's been seconded. Do you need any additional clarification? Everybody got it? Got okay. it. All right, let's vote. Oh, wait, Councilmember Covado? No? I, I was just gonna say for clarity, it, it includes commercial businesses as well, just for people that are watching at home, there is a relief for, for them as well. So it's the same whether it's a residential customer or commercial customer, so they'll get the same information or they can call the, the, the hotline or the city and they can make those arrangements as well. Okay. Do you, do you have one more comment? I have one more thing, is That's that okay? short. Thank you so much, very short. Okay. Um, I'm trying to, to let the public know out there that we're providing some sort of relief. We do care, and I want to make sure that we value our time just as they value ours out there in the public. We're here. It's taking stress, taking you away from your family, uh, but we should be making some forward motion at every meeting on something or another, and this is my effort with the council to make some forward motion to let the community know that we do care and that we're here. So thank you. 
All right, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Item number six, designation of city's agents in applying for reimbursement from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, and that is our city manager. And actually, I'm Jasmine McGinty has been the expert in this area, so she's going to give the uh, staff report. Thank you. All righty. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, Jasmine McGinty, Senior Admin Analyst in Admin, um, and I'm going to give the presentation on um, the designation of applicants agent resolution um, for FEMA reimbursement. So um, this, we recommend that the Council adopt, um, you guys adopt the resolution 6313, which approves the designation of applicants agent resolution which authorizes the city manager or additional authorized agents to submit um, a request for public assistance to Cal OES, um, which is the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services for re uh, reimbursement of eligible emergency protective measures um, for a, re a potential federal reimbursement for funds related to COVID-19. So um, as we all know, on March 13th, 2020, the President of the United States declared a national emergency. Um, which is in regards to the coronavirus pandemic. So as a result of that declaration, it allows for local governments, including the city of Lompoc, to be eligible to seek reimbursement for some of those funds related, directly related to COVID-19. Um, so as part of the request for public assistance, um, California cities have to have a Cal OES 130 form, which is the designation of application, applica applicants agent resolution. Um, and it just authorizes the city manager, the man management services director, and the community or the community development director to submit an RPA request for public assistance to Cal OES to, um, to hopefully get reimbursed for those funds. Um, so the resolution attached here designates those people to submit the RPA to Cal OES. Um, and yeah, so. There's no immediate fiscal impact for adoption of the resolution. Hopefully, once this is passed, uh, the Cal, one Cal OES 130 form has to be approved by the governing body um, in order for us to be eligible to qualify for that federal funding. So we are asking you guys to adopt the designation of applicants agents resolution as part of the RPA package from FEMA and Cal OES and authorizing the city manager to take any other necessary action to apply for reimbursement for those funds. So that concludes my um, presentation and we are open for questions, should you have any. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, we will go to public comment. Thank you, Ms. McGinty. Any in room? If you're calling in, it's 805-875-8201. And remember to turn down your TV, radio, or computer. Were there any written commentary on this? There's one item from Mr. Ron Fink. Everybody, uh, the council has received it. It is on the website and it has been provided to the public. It's up to you if you want me to read it. No, thank you. Thank you. No calls. Seeing no calls, we will close public comment and bring it back to council. Councilmember Vega. Um, this resolution is, is uh, I approve of it except for the last page on page one, um, where it says, it is, the box is checked, page one of two. This is a universal resolution and effective for all open and future disasters for up to three years following the date of approval below. Um, I would make a motion to approve if the lower box was checked and specific to as in the staff report to the COVID-19 virus, which will accommodate and accomplish the same goal. That's my motion. I would make a motion to accept with the, cha with the change of that box to be the lower box instead of up to three years. Uh, it would be for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I, I believe some clarity from staff where the city manager is needed because it often takes more than a year and you might have to extend 
um, related to this, and that's why you choose the three years is due to the time frame associated with potential reimbursements. Is that correct? Part, part of it could be that actually this this allows us, and this was we just Jasmine and I just sat on a training issue today with it. Um, the Cal EOS trainer said they recommend doing this. They said you should always have this ready to go. Um, the city hasn't. Uh, we I don't know when we if we had it ready to go before. But Cal EOS says you need it ready to go because you don't know when the next um, emergency might happen. Could be a flood or an earthquake. And if you have to go through this process, you're behind the eight ball. So um, by doing this, it allows it to go up for three years. And then in the end of three years, if we don't come back and do it again and you know earthquake or flood happens, then we're behind the eight ball again. So it's the practice from Cal EOS says this is the best way to do it, which is why we followed their their direction. So you're following the direction that the trainers have given and that most of the other communities are doing as well when they file this? That is correct. Okay. Um, I'd like to maintain my motion because there's no date specific on this and the staff report does specifically name out COVID virus or coronavirus. So I want to stick to what it says. Uh, there's no time limit, so that doesn't apply. So as long as this pandemic is ongoing, there's no expiration date on this. So it accomplishes the same thing. Um, so I'd like to at least restrict it to that, to exactly what the staff report says. So that's why I'd like the second box check, not up to three years for any emergency. That's my motion. And uh, Council, Member <clears throat> Council Member Vega, what we would need to do then if that motion passes, just get the, there's a blank there for the disaster number. So we just get that number from Cal OES and we put that in. Okay, perfect, perfect. That's what my motion would be. Council Member Mosby. I mean, I, I, I understand where the city manager is coming from, but the, the resolution does line it up as you're looking at one specific one. Right. Well, it, the way the 130 form set up is for any open and future. So if you read that, it says because anything could happen, we could have an earthquake during this period of time, too. So it's. But is that, is that diagrammed in the resolution somewhere? I don't recall. I can see where. Councilmember Vega is saying that you're talking about COVID-19, but then the next page you're asking about three years of anything else that might happen. And I, I know how hard it is to get these forms lined up. I understand the logic of them having lined up. So maybe if the resolution was changed to line with the document on the other side, maybe that would be something that would. I'd have to ask our city attorney if that's able. If the council wanted, we could add a section to the resolution that says the council's intent is also for this <clears throat> resolution to apply for any other emergencies that are declared in the next three years, and then it would encompass all those emergencies. I don't know if Council Member Vega would accept the attorney's potential. Um, no, I'd like to stick to the staff report. You're trying to modify a staff report that wasn't written by us, it was written by them. All they're asking for is a response. So we should respond instead of trying to modify, but thank you, sir. I appreciate it, but I want to respond to the actual, there's no, uh, there's no negative to this. Uh, because it, it says on both pages it's for the COVID virus pandemic, both pages, front and back. No, I, so if you would... Uh, I understand, but I also understand why they, they asked to do it for longer so that we didn't have to bring back another um, staff I'll report. stick with my motion. If you don't like it, then you don't have to vote for it. Thank you. You're right. Any more? Okay. Council Member Starbuck? Did we do one of these when we did a state of emergency in the riverbed? No, we didn't have, this is a, a different application for a different type of emergency, if you will. <laughs> they, have, they have a lot of forms. That's how we, we were on these training calls and they said, does everybody have their 130 form? Like, I, we had no idea. So we found out we didn't have one of these on file with anybody. So these are one of the things we've had to- Would this be applicable for that type of an emergency if we had to go back to the river? I, I don't think so because it wasn't a declared like now we have a declared state emergency and federal emergency and a county emergency. So us declaring it doesn't rise to the level of a governor has to declare the emergency. Council member Cordova. Could it be considered right now since, um, you know, there, there could potentially, there is a population that is in the riverbed that 
um, if we were able to do something um, via testing for them, I don't know, I'm just thinking outside the box that we could swoop all that in because then that would get people out and we would be able to get them tested if there's a way, I don't know. We'd have to go back and ask because it's just that trickle down from the federal to the state to the county to us. It's the reverse where we'd be saying, we want you to declare an emergency. So we'd have to ask the governor to declare an emergency for our riverbed or whatever it might be. So we can attempt. Councilmember Mosby. I'll go ahead and second Councilmember Vega's option. Um, and if you guys need to, I guess you can bring back another staff report clarifying. I understand what he's getting at, so. I'd actually prefer a substitute motion that allowed the flexibility because we had a tsunami morning two weeks ago. There was an earthquake on, in Nevada um, at the edge of California a week ago. There, there is other things that could happen in this and I would really hate to be caught out during all of this and not have filed like the other cities are and be competitive to get access to these dollars because we didn't take advantage of filing um, an open-ended document that allowed us to. So I, I'd, I'd prefer to substitute and fix the resolution to match the application. Councilmember Cordova. And again, for clarity, this is giving our um, city manager as well as our um, finance uh, manager and the director of community development director the authority to basically submit for us to get a reimbursement that is correct correct my goodness if this is not a power trip i will make the 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 motion to um the alternative motion to accept it as it is and allow our city the opportunity to submit for filing and get the money for and try and attempt to get the money for our city. So you second my motion, my substitute motion. Yes. Thank okay. you. All right. So the process on this is that we now have to, if I'm correct in remembering our substitute motions, we have to vote on the substitute motion first or the motion first. We vote on the substitute motion first. Thank you. All right, so the substitute motion is that we accept staff's um, report, make the small adjustment to the resolution to match, and allow them to submit under the ability to cover the next three years of issues, whether related to COVID or any other emergency that occurs. It's been moved and seconded. And Mayor? Yes. That small adjustment to the resolution would be what I stated earlier? Yes. Okay. Yes, it would. All right. So that is what is up for a vote. Uh, Council Member Starbuck? Just a question. What was the adjustment? It was to add a section to the resolution that says the Council's intent is also to uh, not only address the COVID-19 emergency, but also allow this uh, designation of applicants agent to apply to any future disaster in the next three years. Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, it's not about a power trip. I understand what Councilmember Vega is stating. His, his thing is that if you're saying something, line it up right. I understand it. And I, I think the city manager could have come back with his document. And it's just a, technical as it is, I think it's important to be correct on these. And if if you filed this and have done this before, if you filed this and you had it with this, with that went to the state, they might kick it back because it says it doesn't allow you to do that. I've well, kind of been it, in that quagmire before. It, it is, I mean, it says for anything open. So right now the COVID is the open one and then any future one. So this I'm, is all, this is basically I'm, what the county was directing. I, I, I got you. I just know that sometimes the technicality with these dealing with FEMA is you did what 13 years with a FEMA deal one time and yep. sometimes one of these little things like that can't kick you. So that's why I, I came along with that. It can go either way. It's not about a power trip. All right, so let's vote. And that passes for one. All right, um, that is our current agenda. I would like to ask the indulgence of the um, council for an emergency agenda item addition. 
so that if there's a need for discussion, we can actually discuss and make a decision. And that's regarding future meeting formats during um, COVID-19. So that's my request. I would like two um, supports to have that discussion. Yes. Just to explain the procedure here, you're asking to add an item to the agenda. Um, <clears throat> so in order to do that, the council would need a vote, need okay. to get three votes. And because the basis for adding this item, item is an emergency, uh, the finding that you would make to add this item is that there's a need for immediate action um, and uh, that we cannot wait until the next meeting. So that would be the uh, vote that's needed, the three votes of the council. And then it's an item to discuss, again, just for clarity. The, the format of future meetings during the state of emergency. Okay. Thank you for that clarity. Councilmember Mosby. Isn't there a timing when you're supposed to make the motion for an emergency? Wasn't there something that had to be at the beginning so the public would have time to assemble? Uh, if, you, if you feel that. I'm just thinking it was in our handbook as such. I'm just trying to remember that there was something that you're supposed to do at the beginning of the meeting so you had a time frame for the people to assemble if they needed to comment. Just it could be. If you feel that way, then we then we can vote to, to sure. not add the item if you think that there's not been public notice of it. So any other questions before we continue this? Um, I do believe in this particular emergency, the option is to call in. And so that, that option still exists um, because one of the things I'd like to talk about is public attendance, given all the other communities have moved to allowing the public to stay home and not uh, open the city hall to potential um, exposure. So I would just like to at least start with that discussion. So um, that's my request to start there, but I wanted to leave it open to any additional discussion we might need to have regarding meeting formats. So. If um, there are no further questions, please vote. And that fails at 3-2. So we will go to written communications regarding general issues. Nothing more than you've already received. Thank you. Um, this is your final chance for a call-in um, on any matter regarding the city, it's 805-875-8201. And remember to turn down your TV, radio, or computer if you do call in. Seeing no one calling in, we will close oral communications and bring it back to council comments, meeting requests, and reports. Councilmember Vega. I'd like all the people that had phoned me and voiced their concerns about their utility bills um, and the concerns about their family and their family's health. I've had to uh, read off some of the updates we've gotten as far as the COVID virus. So I'd like to I appreciate all the updates that we've got from the public health department. Um, so anyway, we're, we're doing what we can here. Let's all stay home and safe. Uh, the people that are here as essential uh, deemed essential are here helping to solve these problems and make sure the health and safety of your families are number one. So thank you. Councilmember Cordova. I don't have anything. Thank you. Councilmember Starbuck. No reports. Thank you. Councilmember Mosby. I got two small requests. One, one is aligned with the passage of the sales tax and was one of the things we had in the budget that was uh, the three PD positions that we had held out for balancing the budget and um, at the discretion of the city manager I'd like to free up those three positions at his discretion to um, program and fill it when he feels that he's, he's capable to do that but to have that come back for our whatever we need to do to finalize that, to open that back up for him, along with the 1.75 park positions. 
um, which would allow him to back and have back in his playbook things, items that we took out for balancing the budget. Um, I know that he'd be working with the finance director and obviously it wouldn't happen until after, after July 1st, but it takes a little while to stage these up and get these three things to, and I, it'd give him the ability to do this. I'll give you a second. Are we going down the right path to do this for you? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, they, they'll bring it back. Yeah, yeah we'll I know bring, it'll we'll, come back, you know, yeah. but it, it's... We can bring back and it'll have the costs and everything else associated uh, You know, again, we're spending the tax money now that we don't even have, but understanding the fact that it'll take you a little while to get it figured out to bring right. it back, right? Well, and, and in that, it could stay July 1st is the, the earliest that it could take place. Uh, I'll give it a third. And then it takes quite a while to... Iron to line them up and hire and everything else, so you'll be, but it puts it back in his ballpark. The other thing that, that needs to happen, of course, you know, we get through this economic development needs to, needs to be positioned and get back. Um, we had suspended the funding for the chamber. Um, I like, it's gonna take a little while to get a contract negotiated and lined up, but put it back out for the, um, the city manager to in, enter in the negotiations and bringing back a chamber contract and a funding uh, along with that aligning uh, our economic development element with the chamber and um, uh, what I would call a, a business assistance team with the chamber, something they used to have in the past, but align those up in the contract. And um, it's gonna take a little while for the negotiations for this to go through and I think now's the time to thinking a couple months down the road um, to start initiating this. So. Question. Council Member Stuffett. So going down the same thought process again, this is something that'll come back to council and it'll be probably well after COVID's over and we've established what type of a revenue stream we're gonna get at that point and. That is correct. I'll give you a second on that. I'll give you a third. I'll stop at that. But everybody, um, like we're, we're doing well. It's interesting to see that the prison numbers are now finally recognized to be in ours, our, our counts every day, but we do have some issues. I don't know if it's people not staying close enough or not. There's not enough data out there for us to see what's going right or wrong. But right now our numbers are going up significantly, uh, kind of like a rocket ship. I don't think there's a curve involved with what's going on right now. So it's a little, a little scary. Some people ask me, um, is this serious? It's serious. Um, I, I think people need to continue doing what they're doing, only a little more so. I don't know, we're, we're not talking about rising up to the level that they are in other places where it's a misdemeanor fine. Um, I know South County, I think, or in Ventura, they're doing that currently right now, um, of, of the finding when they're seeing these assemblies and such that are over the top. But um, everybody in Lompoc, let's do our best. Thank you. Um, the meetings haven't been in person, but I've attended um, as a representation for the city, the bi-weekly um, bi -weekly county public health legislative brief briefings. There's weekly briefings with our assembly member Cunningham regarding state issues and um, weekly phone calls with our state uh, representative, I mean, our federal representatives that I've been on. Vandenberg was kind enough to loop us in on what they are doing. Um, the reason you're not seeing much out of the air base is they have gone to um, full lockdown except for essential services and um, sm some contractors there. They've also aggressively tracked and traced who has um, been exposed and been able to contain it and not have um, a massive outbreak unlike the federal prison. Um, we have asked that public health call out the federal prison line as a subset to better explain to our community because lumping it in with our regular numbers um, is creating concern and it is still a concern because many of those staff members 
do live in our community. So the wearing of the mask, that is really more about if you are asymptomatic, if you yourself may or may not have already had this or been exposed to it and you don't show any symptoms, you could still transmit it. So I encourage anyone out there who feels more comfortable doing it, wear the mask. Um, preserve the N95s and the surgical masks for those that are in the hospital scenario. Our numbers are rising. The Board of um, Prisons is looking at ways to contain it. If you go to their website, they have an action plan. They're supposedly addressing it, but it is a super spreader site because they are in confined spaces. The county is only testing at tier one, meaning if you are a first responder, a healthcare worker, or you're in one of these scenarios like a, a convalescent home or a prison, those are the only ones actually getting the test unless you so, show extreme symptoms. Otherwise, you're told to quarantine at home and see if you can't recover there because they just don't have the tests. So the biggest issue is the modeling done by the county um, was presented today at the Board of Supervisors. And one case looked at 40% adherence to the social distancing and that might yield nearly 1,200 patients by June 25th in our hospitals. If 55% 55 of compliance would mean a peak um, of 42 in August. So what they're really trying to say is until we better understand what's going on with this, we should all treat it very seriously. We should all respect each other's fear of that and whatever level that is, be helpful, be kind, be calm, be safe, support each other, and please don't hesitate to call our hotline at 1-805-875-80271 for local information of many flavors regarding the nonprofits assisting, regarding the HEAP programs, regarding SBA, and we can put you to the right contacts. If it's COVID-specific related, the health department has a number, 1-833-688-5551. That is seven days a week, nine to six. They will answer your questions about COVID-19 concerns. And last but not least, if you're an individual who needs assistance and you're living alone and you're unsure, there is a countywide line. It's 211. If you call it and you explain what your issue or concern is, they will put you in the right connection with the appropriate uh, entity that can assist you. So again, 211 is able to assist you, whether it's mental health issues due to the isolation, whether it's um, experiencing domestic violence because you're now stuck at home and, and don't have that relief. Please reach out. A lot of the um, community is here for you and we wanna be of help. The last thing I heard from tonight before logging out of email was Lompoc Valley Medical is now accepting supplies during the pandemic. Those are N95 masks, isolation gowns, face shields, eye shields, procedure masks, nitrile gloves, goggles, disinfectant bleach, cavicide disinfectant wipes, and hand sanitizers. And you can reach directly out to their outreach coordinator at 805-588-3774. This information, again, will be available if you call the hotline tomorrow. They will have this information. Thank you all for staying at home. Thank you for social distancing. Thank you for those that are capable of working from home. And most especially, thank you to all the essential workers out there who are putting yourself at risk. Um, we will adjourn this meeting until our next one, which will be, if I can get back to my final page, because I already turned it over, April 21st, 2020.